breathing in toxic air. Outdoor events canceled. People asked to remain indoors. Millions taken hazardous air as smoke from Canada's wildfires pours over parts of the country. The lingering impact and how to protect yourself. Plus, I ended up in the hospital. Um, I was there for two and a half weeks, constantly vomiting. There's no test that we can do. There's no blood test. It doesn't show up on a CAT scan. I don't want another family to go through what we have. It's a rare and dangerous illness that strikes some marijuana users, what may be causing an increase in cases. And so many people take away from our culture and they don't want to give credit to it. But Jamaican culture, we do inspire a lot of other genres. We explore the new era of reggae as it permeates mainstream music while evolving in its own right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. We thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the arrival of the chief suspect in the Natalie Holloway disappearance, Yorin Vandersloot in the U.S. from Peru to face extortion and wire fraud charges, plus the scams involving AI voice clones going after consumers and how to defend against them. And one day after the White House vetoed a bill that would have ended the administration's student loan forgiveness program, where do student loans stand now? We take a look by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin with that toxic air from Canada putting 120 million Americans at risk tonight. A shift in wind may provide relief for some, but that may just envelop new areas with all this smoke. The orange sky from the hazardous air reached Washington, D.C. today and even forced the White House to cancel a pride event. The smoke triggered an air quality emergency in Philadelphia, and the shifting winds brought the smoke all the way to Cleveland. In New York City, the skyline was still covered in haze. All racing at Belmont Raceway was canceled today, two days ahead of the Triple Crown event, the Belmont Stakes. The smoke also caused major travel disruptions and resulted in ground stops for a time at a number of major airports. Is there any relief in sight? Rob Marciano is standing by with the forecast. But first, Trevor Ault leads us off with the air quality alerts for millions of Americans. Tonight, that monster plume of wildfire smoke spreading deeper into the U.S. After New York City registered what's likely its worst air quality of all time Wednesday, cities to the south and west from New Jersey and Pennsylvania to D.C. and beyond enveloped in that toxic haze. My daughter's got asthma really bad, so she's just stuck in the house. She can't really come out at all. Overnight, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania hitting 491 on the air quality index's 1 to 500 scale, even worse than New York City's 484 on Wednesday. In Washington, D.C., the city's first code purple air quality advisory, signifying very unhealthy air. When they told me it was code purple, I thought it was getting better. So we're not even used to this language to deal with this type of air quality. Our Rob Marciano on the National Mall. Yesterday was bad, today even worse here in D.C. Smoke shrouding our nation's capital. At the other end of the mall, standing at 550 feet tall, the Washington Monument, can't even see it. The White House forced to postpone a pride event on the South Lawn that some 2,000 people were set to attend, and the Nationals calling off tonight's baseball game. In Newark, New Jersey, the state's largest school district canceling all classes. Health officials warning continued exposure to the particulates in the air is especially harmful to young children. This is because they breathe more air relative to their size and are more active than most adults. Parents now told to watch for signs like chest pain, shortness of breath, and wheezing. And the source of the smoke? Those wildfires burning in Canada. Hundreds of them still out of control in multiple parts of the country. The U.S. has sent assets and more than 600 firefighters to Canada so far. President Biden speaking with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, promising to send more air tankers and any additional help they need to put out the fires, calling them a stark reminder of the impacts of climate change. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Let's get straight to Rob Marciano. Rob, how long will all this smoke hang around? Well, it's, you know, we'll get some widespread relief, really not until till next week. You'll see pockets of some clarity, but we're not going to get out of this for some time to come. As for yesterday, Lindsay, the results are in. When you talk about population density, it was the worst air quality our nation has seen as a whole since 2006. All right, let's get to those colorful maps we've grown accustomed to the, the past a few days and track where this unhealthy air is going to. Pittsburgh, Buffalo, you're going to get more of it by tomorrow morning. Philadelphia, Baltimore, in through uh 
and through southern Jersey, Delaware as well, and as far back as uh, Louisville and Columbus, Ohio, maybe even Fort Wayne, Indiana by tomorrow night. Uh, so we're not quite out of this for sure. But what will happen over the weekend, and some of this smoke will thin, but the air will still be unhealthy in many spots. A uh, front's going to push toward, toward us. It'll help break down that blocking pattern and bring a change in the wind speed and wind direction come Monday night and hopefully some much needed range of those wildfires in Canada. But that's not till at least Monday or Tuesday. Lindsay, the sky is behind you. I must say, though, do look a bit better than they've been looking the last few days. Rob, our thanks to you. Now to the investigation into the former president. Sources tell ABC News that federal prosecutors have told former President Trump that he is this target of a criminal probe over his handling of classified documents after he left the White House. ABC's chief justice correspondent Pierre Thomas has the very latest. Tonight, the special counsel putting Donald Trump on notice he could soon face federal indictment, delivering a letter warning the former president that he is the target of an ongoing grand jury investigation into his handling of hundreds of classified documents. Trump has insisted all along that he's done nothing wrong. All I know is this. Everything I did was right. We have the Presidential Records Act, which I abided by 100%. But special counsel Jack Smith has been investigating whether Donald Trump illegally retained classified information and then obstructed the government's efforts to retrieve it. After leaving the White House, Trump spent months haggling with the National Archives over whether he had in fact returned all government records as required by law. The Justice Department then obtaining a court-ordered subpoena. But when the FBI learned Trump still had sensitive records, despite his team's insistence that they had turned everything over, agents raided his home at Mar-a-Lago, seizing more than 100 classified documents. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. Trump has argued that he declassified any material that he took from the White House. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. But Trump's attorneys have offered no specific evidence in court that records were declassified. And prosecutors clearly believe they have evidence that proves otherwise, including Donald Trump on tape, allegedly admitting he held on to sensitive material. All rather damning there. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, uh, what are we hearing from the former president tonight? Well, Lindsay, in a sign of just how serious the situation may be, Trump has not posted anything at all on social media all day. But we're told he's been meeting with advisors at his golf club in New Jersey, clearly bracing for the possibility of an upcoming indictment. Lindsay? Pierre Thomas for us. Our thanks to you, Pierre. Now to the Supreme Court and a major ruling that upheld the Voting Rights Act. The court found Alabama's newly drawn voter maps deny black voters a voice. Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh joined the liberal justices in the 5-4 to four decision. Alabama will now have to redraw its maps that could give Democrats another seat in the House. And the decision could lead to changes in other states as well. ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran reports. Tonight, a Supreme Court stunner. Two conservative justices, Chief Justice John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh, joined the court's liberals in striking down Alabama's congressional map that critics said diluted the power of black voters. In a 5-4 to four decision, the court upheld a lower court ruling that found a redistricting map drawn by the Republican-led Alabama legislature violated the Voting Rights Act because it only drew one district out of seven that had a majority of black voters, even though more than one in four Alabamians are black. In his opinion for the court, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that the Voting Rights Act does not permit a state to provide some voters less opportunity to participate in the political process. The court's ruling, Roberts added, rested on a fair reading of the record before us, adding that record contained undeniable evidence of Alabama's extensive history of repugnant racial and voting-related discrimination. In a fierce dissent, Justice Clarence Thomas said the approach Roberts and the liberals endorsed amounted to hijacking the districting process to pursue a goal that has no legitimate claim under our constitutional system, the proportional allocation of political power on the basis of race. Today's ruling will have immediate impacts, another congressional district in Alabama with a majority black population, and more. This is going to have an impact far beyond um, Alabama and will have an impact on who controls the United States House of Representatives after the 2024 election. Wide-reaching implications here. Terry Moran joins us now. And Terry, just give us a little more detail about how this ruling could have far-reaching implications beyond just the state of Alabama. 
Well, Lindsay, this ruling really does resuscitate the Voting Rights Act after the Supreme Court really diminished its importance 10 years ago in the case of Shelby County versus Holder. And it does so by making the redistricting the real battleground in voting rights cases. The Cook Political Report, uh, which analyzes and handicaps elections, has already today changed its ratings for five House races, moving each one of them towards the Democrats. And that's just the beginning. Uh, the Cook Political Report saying this really sends shockwaves right across the political landscape. Lindsay? It sure does. Terry Moran for us just outside the Supreme Court. Thanks so much, Terry. At least 19 children and one adult were injured when a boardwalk collapsed in Texas in Surfside Beach on the Gulf of Mexico. Multiple rescue helicopters rushed to the scene, transporting five people to the hospital. The injuries are said to be non-life-threatening. The cause of the collapse is under investigation. Overseas, a horrific knife attack in the French Alps targeted children. A man ran through a park and stabbed four young children between 22 months and three years old. One of the victims was in a stroller and was stabbed repeatedly. Here's James Longman. Tonight, the moment a man suspected of stabbing four children at a French playground is taken down, shot by police. Here he is, knife in hand, being chased by a passerby. At around 9.45 a.m. at this tourist hotspot at the base of the French Alps, the 31-year-old is alleged to have begun stabbing adults and children at random, at least one attacked while in their stroller. According to officials, the youngest victim is just 22 months old, the oldest three, some now with life-threatening injuries. The suspect is described by authorities as a Syrian national, and he also attacked two adults before he was stopped. He's now in the hospital in police custody. Tonight, France's president, Emmanuel Macron, calling it an attack of absolute cowardice, saying some victims are between life and death. James Longman joins us now. James, any word on a motive? No, Lindsay, the motive remains unknown, although it's not thought to be terror-related. This is a man who was known to be homeless. He'd been seen washing in the lake by police, but other than that, hadn't had any run-ins with them. He had had uh, an asylum application granted to him in Sweden uh, 10 years ago. Now, those children, the four children, they remain in a very serious condition in the hospital. The prosecutor said today their condition was extremely fragile. But I do want to leave you with a little bit of hope. Uh, we understand the mayor says that when this attack took place, Place, six high school students who were nearby decided to link arms around the children to try to shield them. A bit of light in the darkness. Lindsay? We appreciate that silver lining there. James Longman, our thanks to you. Euron van der Sloot has arrived in the U.S. after his extradition from Peru. He's the prime suspect in the disappearance of Alabama teenager Natalie Holloway 18 years ago. Now here to face charges that he extorted Holloway's mother for a quarter of a million dollars. ABC's Elwin Lopez reports from Birmingham, Alabama. Nearly two decades ago, Natalie Holloway vanished on her high school graduation trip in Aruba. And tonight, the main suspect in the Alabama teen's disappearance, Euron van der Sloot, is on American soil behind bars in Birmingham. He is facing extortion and wire fraud charges for allegedly demanding a quarter of a million dollars from Holloway's mother. That sum reportedly in exchange for information leading to the teen's body. This morning, Vandersloat handed over to the FBI by authorities in Peru. Back in 2005, authorities say Holloway was last seen driving off with three young men, including 17-year-old Vandersloat. He was never charged and has maintained his innocence over the years. Tonight, her mother Beth stating in part, I am overcome with mixed emotions, adding that today she is hopeful that some small semblance of justice may finally be realized. She's certainly been waiting a long time for that. Elwin Lopez joins us now. Elwin, what happens next in this case? Yeah, Lindsay, Vandersloot will be arraigned here tomorrow at this courthouse behind me. He will not be here in the United States for long. He still has to finish his sentence in Peru. But, Lindsay, if he's convicted here, he would have to return to the U.S. in 15 years. Lindsay. Elwin Lopez, our thanks to you. To the Florida neighbor accused of shooting and killing a mother of four through her front door, now appearing before a judge, the suspect has been charged with manslaughter and assault and ordered to remain behind bars with the sheriff's department now listing her as a suicide risk. Here's ABC's Victor Akendo. Tonight, the woman accused of killing her neighbor, shooting the mother of four right through her front door in front of her children, appearing before a Florida judge. Good morning, ma'am. What is your name? Susan Lorenz. Susan Lorenz, seen in a green suicide prevention vest in the Marion County Jail, 
listed as a suicide risk, according to the Sheriff's Department. Police say on Friday, Lawrence confronted 35-year-old Ajika A.J. Owens' children for playing in this field near her residence. Lawrence allegedly throwing an iPad and skates at the children. When Owens knocked at Lawrence's apartment, her 10-year-old son standing by her side, police say the neighbor fired a single shot through the locked front door, striking her in the chest. For days, Owens' family called for Lawrence's arrest. Florida has a stand-your-ground law that permits the use of deadly force if there is a presumption of fear. The sheriff saying the law does not apply in this case. Lorenz charged with manslaughter. This situation is a prime example of when it was not justified. It was simply a killing. Neighbors say this isn't the first time she's argued with children. She's got history. She was the one who started everything in the first place. And Lorenz will be held behind bars pending a bond hearing. If convicted, she could face up to 30 years in prison. Lindsay? Victor, thank you. Christian evangelist and former presidential candidate Pat Robertson passed away early this morning, best known for his political commentary on the 700 Club and as the founder of the Christian Broadcasting Network. Robertson started the network back in 1960, eventually growing to become incredibly influential in Christian conservative circles. Known for his contributions in turning the religious right into a powerful political force, he also drew outrage with many of his claims, including when he agreed with Jerry Falwell that abortionists and gay people were to blame for 9-11. Pat Robertson Robertson was 93 years old. So much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, what millions could be facing in the months ahead as student loan repayments are on the cusp of coming due. But next, Juju Chang looks at the possible link between the increase in recreational marijuana and a rare condition that for some has become fatal. We became more and more aware of this condition because more and more people are now using marijuana products. Marijuana products now have far more THC, which we believe is the main chemical compound responsible for this. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. The story is we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. A rare and painful illness has begun to appear in some marijuana users. It's known as CHS, and it's become more and more prevalent despite its difficulty to diagnose. In tonight's Prime Focus, in partnership with our colleagues at Nightline, we take you to one mother speaking out after the shocking and tragic death of her teenage son and her efforts to bring attention to this mysterious illness. Here's ABC's Juju Chang. You were saying that this is the room where he passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my bed was right there. Getting rid of it, it was hard. It was really hard. 
It's in this room that Regina Denny watched her teenage son take his last breath. Why is it so important for you to keep so many memories in this room? It makes me feel close to him. One of my biggest fears is that he'll be forgotten. His life was just getting started. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had plans. Those plans tragically cut short in October 2018. Brian just 17 years old when he died in his Indianapolis home. The cause, something Regina didn't even think was dangerous, never mind deadly. He was a sweet kid. He was funny. If you were sad, you weren't sad around him for very long because he would do the silliest stuff to make you smile. Like many teens, he loved fishing, basketball, drive-in movies. <laughs> and he was a devoted uncle to his nephew, Zayden. But in the spring of 2018, Regina watched as her son's health declined. Tell me when he first started getting sick. The first time that I noticed the vomiting was April 7th. He was vomiting so much that he said he was feeling tingling in his face and his, his hands. When you took him to the doctors, what did they think? They took Brian ahead of me. I came in and he had IVs in both arms. Um, he was on oxygen. They said that the muscle contraction was a, an anxiety attack from all the vomiting. Did they run a bunch of tests? Mm -hmm. What were they looking um, for? Anything. Um, they did say he was dehydrated. Um, his kidneys had went into failure. And he's 17, mm -hmm. healthy. Yeah. A complete medical mystery. He had lost pro probably about 30 pounds in a little over a month. Then, as I was talking to the ER doctor, another doctor happened to walk past our room. And she put her head through the door and she said, uh, do you smoke marijuana? And Brian kind of looked at me and I was like, look, be honest. And he said, yeah. And she said, does hot showers and baths help? And he said, yeah. And she said, you have CHS. CHS or cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It's rare. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is a relatively unique condition that we see with patients who use relatively large amounts of marijuana. Patients who suffer from this condition have recurrent bouts of vomiting and abdominal pain. They're terrifically symptomatic and they can get very, very sick. ER Dr. Sam Torbati says he's seen an increasing number of CHS cases come through the doors at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles but diagnosing the condition isn't easy. There's no test that we can do. There's no blood test. It doesn't show up on a CAT scan. I can't really show you an image to say this is what cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome looks like. One Canadian study found that CHS-related ER visits there increased 13-fold over seven years. Researchers point out that during this time, commercial sales of marijuana exploded. And so, too, did the variety of cannabis products available. Dr. Torbati says more studies need to be done. We became more and more aware of this condition because more and more people are now using marijuana products. Marijuana products now have far more THC, which we believe is the main chemical compound responsible for this. In the U.S., cannabis samples seized by the DEA found that potency rose from 4% in the mid-90s to 12% 20 years later. And during that time, the ratio of THC to CBD increased from 14 to 80 times greater. For years, marijuana has been used both recreationally and medically to fight chronic pain and nausea. But for some, it's actually triggering the opposite effect, which is why, in part, CHS is often overlooked or misdiagnosed. I ended up in the hospital. Um, I was there for two and a half weeks, constantly vomiting. <laughs> Erica Hagler first became sick in August of 2018. She was living just outside of Boston at the time, a city known for its top-notch medical care. How hard was it for you to get a diagnosis? They tested me for everything else underneath the sun, and I do mean everything, and they couldn't find a diagnosis. 
So Erica says she went home and did her own research. That's when she came across CHS on the internet. Eventually, she says, a doctor confirmed the diagnosis. Erica says she gave up marijuana immediately. How hard was it for you to stop? Well, once I knew it was killing me, um, I, it was immediate. But for most people, it's not that easy. As Erica began to recover, she started a support group on Facebook called CHS Recovery. It now has more than 20,000 members. When I was on my deathbed in the hospital, I was sitting there praying to God, like, please just get me out of here, get me healthy. I swear that I will help other people. She's connected with people all over the world who are going through the same painful process. People are sharing their experiences. It's pretty graphic. Very graphic. I mean, it's not unusual to see all these graphic images. And so a lot of people suffer burns. Why is that? The burns come from hot showers. Scalding hot showers, something many who suffer from CHS say relieves their symptoms, at least temporarily. Some doctors believe this is because of what possibly triggers symptoms in CHS patients. They say when THC and CBD bind with certain receptors in the body repeatedly, it can spark a severe vomiting or nausea reaction. It's thought that applying scalding heat might trigger something in those same receptors that improves symptoms. What do you tell people who think this will never get better? It does get better. You just have to stay abstinent, take care of yourself. While there isn't a cure for CHS, doctors say patients need to give up marijuana to start feeling better. Patients will say, well, I stopped for two weeks and I didn't get better, so it must not be this condition that you're labeling me with. And we, we educate and say, really, you're going to need to stop for months. Regina says her son Brian agreed to give up marijuana for 45 days. But when the symptoms didn't let up, he got frustrated and started smoking again. That was upsetting, I'm sure. Yeah, I thought maybe there was something else wrong. But Brian would ultimately succumb to complications of CHS just six months after his diagnosis on that fateful fall day. I called his doctor and I told his doctor, I feel like I'm slowly watching my son die. She said that she would call in a prescription for nausea medicine and that the only thing, other thing she could tell me is send him to rehab. So I told Brian, you have to quit or I'm, I'm going to have to do this because I can't do, I cannot watch you die. He says, uh, Mom, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to quit. And I thought, OK. This is, we're, we're going to be okay. But it was too late. He grabs his back. And instinctively, I thought, kidneys. I called 911, and Brian looks at me, and he says, Mom, I can't breathe. And he took his last breath. I remember praying so hard and begging God to take me instead of him. The paramedic came out of the room, and she didn't even have to tell me. I could tell by her face that he was gone. It wasn't until the autopsy report came back that Regina came to terms with what had caused his death. Dehydration due to cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. I had to process that because weed doesn't kill you. But it did. In the five years since Brian's death, Regina has dedicated herself to raising awareness about CHS. Why do you feel so strongly that you want to keep telling Brian's story? Because I don't want another family to go through what we have. Because my son deserves to be remembered. He's making an impact. He's saving people's lives. Our thanks to Juju Chang, and we do have breaking news right now about the former president, Donald Trump. We are soon going to join an ABC News special report with David Muir. We'll get to that as soon as we come back. But we do have a lot more still to get to here on Prime. Coming up, our conversation with Tony Shalhoub on his new movie, Flame and Hot, and how a popular snack may have actually. We are ready for that special report with David Muir. We're going to send it over to him right now about Donald Trump. This is an ABC News special report. Now reporting, David Muir.
Good evening, and we're coming back on the air at this hour with major developments in the special counsel's investigation into former President Donald Trump. ABC News has confirmed at this hour that Donald Trump and his lawyers have just been informed about 20 minutes ago that the former president needs to be at a federal court in Miami on Tuesday at 3 p.m. to be processed on federal charges. This, of course, would be the first president ever to be indicted on federal charges. I want to bring in several members of our investigative team, beginning with Catherine Falders, our senior reporter. And Catherine, what are your sources telling you as far as uh, the number of counts at this point and the range of what's being charged here? David, we're learning from our sources that there appears to be at least seven counts here. This ranges from everything from uh, the willful retention of national defense information to conspiracy uh, to a scheme to conceal to false statements and representations. Uh, obviously, this is part of a years long, more than years long investigation by special counsel Jack Smith and, and Trump's efforts to uh, obstruct the government to give documents in his possession with classification markings back uh, to government investigators who uh, at multiple times throughout this investigation have tried to retrieve them from Trump. They still had questions about whether Trump still currently has classified documents in his possession. But again, uh, we're learning that at this hour, we're told by our sources that there are at least seven counts here, uh, and they range from everything from willful retention of national defense information uh, to conspiracy uh, to concealing documents of record, David. Catherine Falders, uh, our senior investigative reporter with our investigative unit again reporting just moments ago uh, that Donald Trump, the former president and his lawyers have been told to appear in a federal court in Miami next Tuesday, 3 p.m. is the time we're told, but we're still reporting this out. Uh, Catherine's reporting so far at least seven counts, again, our team working on this, at least seven counts uh, ranging from obstruction to willful retention um, to conspiracy, also part of uh, the initial reporting on what could be coming from the special counsel. I want to get right to our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, working his sources over at the Justice Department. Uh, and Pierre, uh, what are you learning from uh, the people you're talking with? Well, David, we have been told by sources who have been following the case that Trump is expected to appear on Tuesday to be processed in connection with these charges. And we've been told by multiple sources that the special counsel had specifically been focusing on efforts to illegally retain classified documents and producing evidence to show that Trump also willfully obstructed the government's efforts to get those documents back. And David, I can put this in perspective. This is perhaps one of the most consequential investigations the Justice Department has done in recent memory. We're talking about investigating a former president who's seeking to be reelected. They knew this was one of the most consequential cases that they've ever pursued, and I'm told that they have built a case month by month to produce compelling evidence to lay out in detail what Trump did in terms of taking the documents from the White House and then what he did in response to a government subpoena to return those documents. Now, we're also being told that law enforcement and sources will be stepping up security in and around that courthouse in Miami uh, because they don't know quite what the response will be. But again, clearly a very consequential moment and we'll be hearing more in the coming hours and days, uh, David. Uh, Pierre, just stick with me here because I know your sources are telling you multiple counts. Catherine's reporting uh, at least seven counts uh, at this hour. And, and Pierre, as you know, uh, these counts range from obstruction, uh, conspiracy, willful retention of documents pertaining to uh, the national defense. Uh, what does this tell you? It would seem it involves more than just the former president when, when you hear conspiracy being listed as one of these potential multiple counts here. When, when you look at the case that they previously laid out in terms of the affidavit for the search warrant in terms of why they went in, it was clear that the government had indications that were, there were people working with the president to perhaps move documents, hide documents. There's a key moment that we've been reporting on for some weeks, David, where uh, apparently after receiving the subpoena, uh, Trump and his associates knew that federal prosecutors were going to come to Mar-a-Lago. And apparently there's surveillance footage from the room where some of these documents were being held in which someone is seen taking the documents out the day before the prosecutors were supposed to get there. And also, David, here's another key thing. Well, you know that the one of the attorneys for 
former President Trump issued a statement provided to DOJ saying, as far as they knew, all the documents had been provided. The FBI then gets a tip that there were still more documents there at Mar-a-Lago. And then when they did that consequential raid, they found more than 100 classified documents, David. Okay, Pierre Thomas, as soon as you learn more from your sources, Pierre, just raise your hand there and we'll come right back to you again at this hour. We are on the air, ABC News live coverage. Former President Donald Trump has been informed. He and his attorneys have been informed that the special counsel uh, will hand down an indictment in this case after a months-long investigation lasting actually more than a year here into the handling of classified documents discovered at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, we are told at this hour multiple counts this involves. Uh, he's been told to appear in federal court 3 p.m. on Tuesday. I want to bring in John Santucci also with the investigative unit. John, of course, covered Donald Trump for years uh, when he was president. Uh, and, and John, as uh, to be expected, uh, we wondered if this would happen and it has played out. The former president confirming himself uh, that he and his attorneys have been informed. Uh, he writes that I have been indicted. David, a very lengthy post from Donald Trump on his social media platform, Truth Social. Um, it's extremely long. He goes on to say he never thought this was possible, calls it a dark day. Um, but David, I can tell you from my sources that have been around the former president for much of the last week, they very much thought this was as possible. They have been huddled in Bedminster, New Jersey, where the former president spends his summers uh, waiting for this today. They have been anxious. They were watching news coverage yesterday of Trump's former spokesperson, Taylor Budowich, going before that grand jury down in southern Florida. And David, uh, that a bit of a mystery to the Trump team. You know, they've been watching friends, allies, and now enemies of the former president go before a grand jury in Washington, D.C. that's been hearing the presentations by special counsel. Jack Smith for the better part of a year, but only up until the last couple of days, few weeks even, uh, did Team Trump learn about this other grand jury. And we believe, David, as we reported here on your show last night, it was when Team Trump received that target letter in just the last couple of weeks that they were told by special counsel Jack Smith that the former president was indeed a target of that investigation. I am told by my sources uh, that the president for the last couple of days has just been waiting for this, knowing it was coming. Uh, he joked to one aide, uh, another one, uh, of course, referring to his first indictment in Manhattan earlier this year. Um, and we know that they are already planning a trip down to Miami, David. Uh, we are told from one source uh, that they are looking at some sort of a campaign event around it, thinking that another indictment will do something better for Donald Trump's chances at a third bit at the White House. I want to go back, John, to that one point you made. We reported here on World News Tonight just earlier this week about that letter uh, that Donald Trump yeah. received, he and his lawyers. Uh, I think to a lot of our viewers, uh, that would sound almost obvious after months and months yeah. of reporting on this investigation. But that was essentially uh, their sort of official signal from the special yeah. counsel that this could very well be coming, and now it's played out tonight. The official signal for sure, David. I mean, a target letter from a federal prosecutor lets you know that you are indeed just that. You are a target. We are looking to indict you on charges. Um, but obviously, David, as you know, it's not a surprise. Between the many people that have gone before the grand jury, the many people that received document retention letters for subpoenas, and let's not forget, David, federal investigators have been to Donald Trump's home at Mar-a-Lago multiple times. And obviously, the big one we all saw nearly a year ago, last August, uh, where federal agents raided Mar-a-Lago looking for documents, looking for records. And as our team has reported, they found hundreds, David. John Santucci, stick with us here. And again, John, as soon as you learn more, just let me know. We'll come back to you. I want to bring in our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, following all of this uh, really every step of the way with us. And Dan, first question for you. When you hear that he's been told to show up Tuesday afternoon uh, in federal court in Miami, in Florida, what does the venue tell you? What more can we glean from this? So, what is in Washington, D.C.? Welcome back to John, and we'll come back to Dan Abrams in just a moment as soon as we get the audio figured out there. John Carl also standing by with me. John, our chief Washington correspondent. Uh, John, we know the venue will play a major role, but the question I wanted to ask you really is a much bigger picture here uh, because I don't want people to grow numb to these headlines that seem to come uh, almost daily. This is something we have not seen before. Uh, the first time a former president has been indicted on federal charges. And again, it's the former president himself tonight who says, I have been told that I have been indicted. David, uh, it, it's truly an historic moment. Uh, Donald Trump, as you mentioned, 
the first president, former president of the United States, to be indicted on federal charges. He's also, this is also the second time a former president has been indicted, period. The first time was also Donald Trump, uh, indicted uh, on local charges. The Manhattan district attorney indicting him on charges related to hush money payments uh, to Stormy Daniels. And we also know that a grand jury is very active in Fulton County, Georgia, uh, looking to bring state charges against Donald Trump related to his efforts to overturn the presidential elections in the state of Georgia. So think about this, David. You have a former president of the United States, uh, currently a candidate for president again, who is now under indictment uh, on state on local and federal charges, and possibly soon also on state charges. Truly an historic moment, and compounded by the fact that as he campaigns now uh, for the presidency for the third time to get back to the White House, he has made fighting back against these charges the centerpiece of his campaign. His campaign slogan uh, at this point is, I am your retribution. That is his message uh, to his supporters. He tells his supporters uh, that prosecutors are going after him because what they really want to do is go after them. Uh, so yes, he is looking, uh, he is battling uh, for his uh, political life here. He may be battling for his freedom. These are serious charges uh, that, that, uh, that could mean a serious jail time. Uh, but as he is doing it, he is making it the centerpiece of his presidential campaign. And in the short term, John, it might help, you know, cultivate support from his, the, the core group of supporters who continue to follow him and believe in him, uh, at least in the short term, when you hear uh, reports from John earlier, John Santucci uh, and others, that he might hold a rally in Florida right around this Tuesday appearance in federal court. The short term, it might help, but over the long haul, when you talk about an indictment already here in New York City in the hush money case, and now a federal indictment from the special counsel, Jack Smith, that is an unanswered question how the American people are going to feel and what they're going to think as they watch this unfold. And how it affects him as a presidential candidate. In New York, they have set a trial date, David, for uh, the end of March next year. That's in the midst of the Republican presidential primaries. We'll see what happens here. We know uh, there's a court appearance, an initial court appearance next Tuesday. Uh, but when is this trial? And when potentially is a, a trial if there's an indictment in Georgia? Uh, he may be spending more time in courtrooms uh, defending himself against, again, serious charges uh, than uh, he is able to spend on the campaign trail. So how will the American people uh, respond to that? How will he campaign around that? And how do the other Republicans handle it? You know, we now are seeing an increasingly crowded field of presidential candidates uh, willing to stand up, Republicans, uh, to stand up and say that they are going to run against Donald Trump with the, the latest uh, addition, you know, entrance to the race and his own vice president and uh, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, once one of his most prominent uh, supporters. So Republicans, not all of them for sure, uh, but, but some prominent Republicans are now uh, standing up and telling Republican voters that it is time to turn the page from the Trump era. No question. The Republican campaigns are watching these developments very closely tonight and, and trying to decipher wh what their strategy is moving forward, how to handle all this. John uh, Carl, our thanks to you as always. Dan Abrams now with us, uh, back with us on the phone here. Dan, a couple of really important legal questions to help guide our viewers at home. When mm -hmm. you heard that this appearance is 3 p.m. Tuesday in Miami uh, federal mm -hmm. court, what does the venue uh, tell you? So that's a very significant point on where the crimes occurred. There are two grand juries. There's one in Washington, D.C., there's one in Florida. And one of the reasons that the one in Florida was so significant is because you generally have to charge a crime where it occurred. And they are alleging that these crimes occurred at Mar-a-Lago. And so that is why you have this grand jury in Florida. Now, I would say something else about the totality of the counts here. There were a lot of possible crimes uh, that were being investigated here. Illegal retention of documents, um, the possible crime with regard to retaining uh, national defense information, obstruction of justice being one of the most important ones. It seems, based on the information we have right now, that he's been charged in connection with all of them. Uh, that, in effect, the book has been thrown at him with regard to all of these counts. Now, the most significant thing we need to wait for is exactly 
what is the evidence? What do they have? There's been a lot of reporting out there about you know, possible audio tapes, possible witnesses who are going to come forward, possible people who were at Mar-a-Lago. The devil is going to be in the details here, I think, on convincing the American public one way or the other. It's very easy for people who are against Donald Trump to just celebrate the indictment. It is very easy for people who want to support Donald Trump to just say, well, this is a witch hunt. The critical point is going to be, what do they have? What's the proof? What's the evidence? What can they present in court? And, and that is the thing we're still going to have to wait for until we can see the specifics surrounding this indictment. And Dan, so many people point to the other classified document cases that are uh, front and center in the news as well. Uh, you know, Mike Pence classified documents found at his Indiana yeah. home. You remember I was interviewing him at his home right after news broke of uh, the search at Mar-a-Lago. And I asked him if he took any classified documents with him when he left the White House. And he said no. Uh, he said it was a mistake publicly and that he was surprised himself that documents were found. He's been cleared now. That was reported by us and other outlets in the last couple of days. Uh, and of course, there's this ongoing look at uh, current president, President Biden, and the classified documents uh, discovered, uh, you know, in his possession along the way as well. Now, again, as you point out, Dan, it's going to be very important to see what they lay out, whether or not this is a speaking indictment once we see it, that will help explain the narrative of what they found to the American people really on all sides of this, no matter uh, where you stand. But at least initially, Dan, given the, the fact that Mike Pence was cleared, uh, and that the special counsel in this case, a very different case, is moving forward with federal charges. Just help viewers at home understand the very obvious uh, differences just from the public reporting on these cases so far. Yeah. Putting aside for a moment exactly what the documents were, putting aside making comparisons between which documents were more sensitive, et cetera, as a legal matter, it's the intentionality of the conduct. Remember, there was a subpoena here issued for specific documents, documents with classified markings on them. That's what the subpoena said, a federal subpoena in May saying, hand over all of the documents that you have with classified markings. Prosecutors here, in effect, saying not only did he not do that, but if there is a conspiracy charge here as well, they knew uh, that they weren't doing it. They were intentionally not turning over these documents. We'll see what evidence they have, if any, of an intentional effort to hide documents. But it is the intentionality of the conduct that is a legal matter makes such a difference here between someone inadvertently, accidentally, mistakenly retaining a document, regardless of its level of classification. That'll be something else we'll have to think about is there are different levels of classification. Um, but it's the intentionality of the conduct that makes this completely different. And let me ask you this. It might be a difficult question to answer at this point, Dan, but is there any sense of relief uh, in Trump world uh, in Bedminster tonight when they learn of the venue that it will be Florida and not uh, mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., where he has to show up, uh, given the fact uh, that there has been some speculation, legal observers have said, that perhaps uh, he would be able to, to sit before a, a more, uh, slightly more sympathetic jury, if you will. No doubt about it. No doubt that Donald Trump would rather have this case in Florida than in Washington, D.C. More sympathetic potential judges, more sympathetic uh, potential jurors, uh, a more sympathetic public in the whole in Florida. But you know, I don't think there was much choice here. I mean, if, if the prosecutors had a choice, meaning if they could just say, oh, well, we'd like to prosecute this in Washington, D.C., they would much prefer to prosecute it in Washington, D.C., for the same reason that Donald Trump would prefer it happen in Florida. But as a legal matter, it is the correct thing to do, to do it in Florida, where the alleged crime occurred. Dan Abrams, our chief legal analyst, uh, with us here tonight following the breaking news at this hour that former President uh, Donald Trump has been indicted, the former president acknowledging uh, so himself uh, uh, through his social media tonight. Uh, and as we've reported here from uh, the get-go, uh, Catherine Fowler's uh, the first to report that at least uh, seven counts our investigative team believes. And again, we've put the category of these charges up on the screen, though the exact detail uh, we have yet to confirm. But 
broad range, obstruction, willful retention, uh, conspiracy, uh, expected to be uh, part of, of these charges, these at least uh, seven counts, that the former president has been told to appear in federal court uh, in Miami on Tuesday, as you heard Dan Abrams saying there, a lot of speculation that there might be some relief in Trump world, uh, given that the venue will be in Florida, uh, given his uh, support uh, from many uh, in Florida. I want to bring in Aaron Katursky, who is in Florida as well tonight as we break this story. And Aaron, talk about, as you so um, carefully did when you were back here in Manhattan during the indictment involving the hush money case. This is obviously a much different level. These are federal charges. The first time we have ever seen this as a country, a former president uh, indicted at the federal level. What will this country see play out come Tuesday afternoon when the former president has been told to show up? A much different kind of case, David, but a very similar process. And once the former president arrives here at the federal courthouse in downtown Miami on Tuesday, it will mark an extraordinary moment for the United States because Trump will be placed under arrest by the very government he was once elected to lead. Once he is formally arrested, Trump will be booked and processed as a federal defendant, and then he will appear before a judge to enter a not guilty plea to the criminal charges that you've outlined. And then perhaps we will understand the full scope of what the former president is facing and how potentially he may start to go about defending himself. All day today, we saw evidence that the grand jury had been nearing this moment, David. We saw members of special counsel Jack Smith's team going into and out of the room where the grand jury has been hearing evidence. Their exact process has been kept secret, but now we know it has culminated in this indictment, and the former president will be here on Tuesday to answer the charges, David. An extraordinary scene the country will watch unfold come Tuesday. Aaron Katursky in Florida for us tonight. Aaron, thank you. I want to bring in our political director, Rick Klein. Rick, you know I always come back to you with this question, and the reason I do it is because I think this is a question people at home uh, have every single time one of these headlines uh, of this magnitude uh, actually uh, breaks involving the former president. Th this time, actually, we have never seen this uncharted territory, but there's nothing that says that, that a former president who's been indicted at the federal level charged uh, that he would not be able to run for office. And, and even if, and this is, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but even if there's some sort of conviction at the end of this long process, what are the ramifications if you're running for president? Yeah, there is no federal law, there's no constitutional provision that allows, uh, that prevents someone from running for president of the United States, even if they are uh, currently behind bars. In fact, in 1920, we had a socialist candidate for president who was serving a prison sentence and got almost a million votes. You have to go back that far for any kind of precedent. And as you said, we're a long way from, from any of that. But look, there's also evidence that the, the last legal case brought against him may have bolstered his standing. Donald Trump only doing better in the primaries since then. Our poll from about a month ago, David, showed that about 54% of Americans thought that he deserved to face criminal charges in this case about classified documents. But that same poll had a numeric advantage for Trump versus Biden. So it may be that a lot of this information is already out there. And we saw Donald Trump tonight set a fundraising appeal within about 15 minutes of breaking the news of his own indictment. He is asking people to raise money. There's no doubt in my mind that it will be a successful appeal because if we know anything about Donald Trump is that his base is extremely loyal. But again, the bottom line, Rick, that even though we're now witnessing a former president being indicted on federal charges at the federal level, uh, he can still run for president. Nothing stops him. Nothing stops him. It becomes practically harder because he has to make court dates. As John Carl was mentioning, the timeline here is very inconvenient, but he is allowed to run for president even while under indictment, even, even if he were to be convicted. Rick Klein, our political director. Uh, Rick, thank you as always. I want to bring in Rachel Scott. She is live in Iowa, which tells you she's already out on the campaign trail covering the race uh, for the White House. Uh, Rachel, I come to you because I know you've been reporting on all of the other Republican candidates. It's now a somewhat crowded field. Uh, we know that Mike Pence entered the fray this week officially. He went so far as to say his former uh, boss uh, should never be president again, should never be allowed to be president again. Chris Christie in the race as well, the former New Jersey governor, who uh, right out of the gate took on Donald Trump and by name. Uh, I, I gather all of these campaigns tonight are watching this play out and deciding what their next steps will be and how far they'll go. 
Exactly, David. But right now, I could tell you that most of this very crowded Republican field is walking a fine line. You heard Trump's own former vice president, Mike Pence, say that he's unfit to serve again, calling out the former president directly and by name when he launched his presidential campaign this week. But just hours ago, I had an opportunity to press Pence on whether or not a former president who was facing multiple investigations best represents the future of the Republican Party. And while Pence told me that he believes there needs to be new leadership. He says that an indictment would further divide the country, but still says that no one should be above the rule of law. You have former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. He says that an indictment does not look good for any uh, political candidate, but is still waiting to see sort of how this all plays out. So far in this very crowded field of 12 Republican candidates, only one candidate, former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, has come out and said that indictments of a former president should be enough reason for them to step aside. But we know that Trump is as defiant as ever. In fact, David, I could tell you right now his campaign is already fundraising off of this news. Rachel Scott in Iowa covering the race for president and what will undoubtedly be a very strong and powerful dynamic in the days, weeks and months ahead. How all the other candidates now handle this who are trying to get that Republican nomination uh, and having to get through Donald Trump to get there. I want to bring in Terry Moran tonight. And Terry, it's a question I haven't been able to ask anyone yet. And this is bigger picture when it comes to the special counsel here, Jack Smith. There has been so little uh, that's been leaked from this special counsel investigation. Of course, we haven't even heard from him. When you see the range of charges, and I've been really careful here because obviously we don't have the document in front of us. We just know at least seven counts. We know the range of these charges. But when you see how significant these charges are and a special counsel who knows uh, the weight of, of history here in this decision, uh, what does that say about the evidence they may or may not have? Uh, to me, David, it shows that this prosecutor, Jack Smith, uh, must believe that he has the evidence to, to make these convictions because he knows this target uh, is unprecedented in our history. And he has demonstrated by not whispering a word uh, to the press, that, that office just did not leak, that he would do it by the book and amass this evidence with care, with the, with the rigor that, want, that are, is expected of federal prosecutors and that he has a reputation for. Because that's the only way this thing becomes normal. And by that, I mean it is an extraordinary, historic circumstance, the indictment of a former president uh, by the Justice Department that he once led, as Aaron pointed out. But it is going to become an ordinary criminal case in federal court. It must for justice to be done equally. There are hundreds, more than 1,500 done every year, and what we can expect is he will have access to all of the documents, Donald Trump will, that, and all of the evidence uh, that will be used against him as any other criminal defendant is. He has a right to a speedy trial in 70 days if he wants it, or he might or he might waive it. This is the, the saving grace of the American system is that it will get put into the courts where the people who do this every day for a living, including Trump's own lawyers, are going to handle it the way every other case is handled. That, that is the only way that the, con the country will have confidence in the outcome of this case, no matter how it goes. But what this tells me is that Jack Smith has done his homework and, and is ready to proceed now, no matter who the target is. And as we focus on Jack Smith here for a moment, Terry, thank you. I want to bring back in Pierre Thomas, who has just learned from his sources that this will be, and you heard me mention this earlier, this question of whether or not this would be a speaking indictment, which essentially means will the special counsel lay out uh, in narrative detail what they've uncovered and why they believe what they've uncovered is truly significant here. And Pierre, you've learned that's exactly what they plan to do. David, I've been told to expect a speaking indictment to lay out chapter and verse what took place because they understand that this is a historic case. They understand who's involved and they know that they have a responsibility to give the American public explicit detail of what they know. Now, I've been talking to sources for months and weeks now, and they have told me that the evidence amassed by the FBI is compelling and, in some cases, devastating. And one of the things that we can see by the conspiracy charges, although we've not yet seen the specifics, is that that speaks to the fact that there were other people allegedly working with Trump to conceal and keep these documents from the federal government. 
And the key here is that some of those people likely have become witnesses, David. Pierre, thank you. I want to bring back in Dan Abrams because, Dan, I know so much of this depends on the venue, uh, the judge who oversees all of this uh, as it plays out. But is there a chance, and I'm asking for those who are watching at home, is there a chance that this all uh, plays out during this election cycle so that voters can witness uh, the evidence, witness what, what a potential jury finds in this case? Could we see this uh, done actually before the 2024 election? I think it's likely that it would happen before the 2024 election. But remember, a lot of that power remains with the defendant himself. Uh, the defendant has a lot of ability to delay or move things more quickly if he wants. So we're going to have to see exactly what Donald Trump decides and his legal team that they want to do about the timing here. But no question that this could all be tried and resolved uh, before the November 2024 election. And again, we always talk political calculation when it comes to Donald Trump, but we're talking about very serious charges here, Dan Abrams. He also has to take into account the real possibility that with these kinds of charges, you're talking about the potential prison time possibilities here if there's a conviction. Absolutely. And I think this is a very different case than the New York case, both factually and politically. I think that we talk a lot about, well, there was the New York case also. I really do believe that case becomes secondary to this case. This one becomes much more significant if Jack Smith has the kind of evidence that Pierre is talking about. It becomes a much more overwhelming one. And this is where politics and law intersect. Maybe in this case, they can convince the public as well. Dan Abrams, our thanks to you. And for those of you watching, as we learned, we came on the air shortly after 7 o'clock Eastern. A former president, Donald Trump, has been indicted on federal charges. The first time we've ever seen this, at least seven counts. Our coverage continues. ABC News Live, ABCNews.com. We go back to programming. Good night. This has been a special report from ABC News. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We, of course, are following breaking news at this hour involving former President Trump. If you're just joining us, here's what we know right now. Sources tell ABC News former President Trump has been indicted on at least seven federal counts. ABC News has confirmed that Donald Trump and his lawyers have just been informed that the former president needs to be in federal court in Miami on Tuesday at 3 p.m. to process on federal charges. This, of course, would be the first former president ever to be indicted on federal charges. This investigation has been ongoing now for more than a year. Special counsel Jack Smith's office has been gathering evidence since November on two fronts, classified documents and on the events leading up to and including January 6th. Less than 24 hours ago, we learned that the former president had recently received a letter from the special counsel's office officially informing him that he was the target of an ongoing investigation. That, of course, signaled that this could be coming. And on Tuesday, we will see what will amount to it. An unprecedented scene. Trump will be placed under arrest by the government who he was formerly elected to lead. Our team is reporting this story out for us tonight. I want to start out with our ABC News contributor and former GOP Congressman John Katko of New York. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. First, let me just get your reaction to this news. A, a grand jury voting to indict the former president now for a second time. It's really a historical event that has transpired here, and the charges are quite serious. Anyone who's ever dealt with classified documents like I have for over 30 years will tell you, when you mishandle classified documents, really bad things can happen. So the penalties in the law are very, very strict in that regard. And so this is a very serious development and something that should be taken very seriously by the, by the, by the former president. A former Trump, uh, former President Trump has insisted all along that, that he's done nothing wrong. Uh, but these do seem to be very serious charges over his handling of classified documents. As a former congressman, what's your view on the issue of his handling of classified documents after he left the White House? Well, I can tell you, I, I handled them for 20 years as a, a organized crime prosecutor before going to Congress and then as head of the Homeland Security in Congress. I can tell you classified documents are very serious matters. They're handled in a very serious manner in secure settings and are never to leave those secure settings. So this is um, the, his handling of those documents on its face. I can tell you from a prosecutor's point of view, um, the fact that they found so many documents at his home and, and the way in which they found them clearly outside a, a classified setting 
in and of itself makes the case extremely strong against the president, the former president. So to me, this is a, this, he, he has a very uh, big hill to climb to overcome these charges because I'm not sure what his defense can be to that. Politically, what kind of impact do you think that this case will have on the former president as he makes yet another bid for the White House? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the question here, right? Uh, his base is his base. He'll, he'll, he'll take on the martyr complex and he'll take on the, uh, the feeling that, you know, they're out to get me. But, you know, your base is your base. But uh, when they're starting to be presented with all this information and all this, this conduct, whether they agree with the, the methods of the, uh, of the charges or not, Sooner or later, they start making a, a value decision. And so uh, this absolutely will not help him going forward. The question is whether it's going to hurt him. Uh, with, his, with his hardcore base, probably not. Those on the fringes of his base, it may impact that. And it, it could be a very serious impact for him in, in a negative way. How do you expect your fellow Republicans still in Congress to react to this? And, and I kind of, by extension, want to ask about, you know, for example, we heard from Tim Scott today, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence. And Mike Pence offered that, you know, I would hope that the Department of Justice does not move forward, not because I know the facts, but simply because I think after years where we've seen a pol politicization of the Justice Department is to undermine confidence and equal treatment of the law. We heard uh, from several people who are running against him now uh, for president, several Republicans who were talking about how they felt that this was divisive and political and they didn't want to see these uh, charges come forward. Uh, nobody wants to see a former president charged with a crime, but but the, the reality is he has been. So now you got to start dealing with the reality of it, right? And uh, I think a lot of people in the Republican Party are loath to uh, um, break ways with with uh, former President Trump and uh, because of his power with the base of the party, which is all important in that primary season. But, um, you know, we have to see how this all unfolds and have to see when the evidence comes out. If this is, in fact, what they call a speaking indictment, that meaning that there's specific facts laid out in the indictment, well, then uh, I think they will get a taste for uh, the conduct that is alleged to have occurred and they'll make some decisions accordingly. So uh, there's a lot of speculation, but make no mistake about it. A lot of people are loath to um, uh, confront or go against uh, the former president because of the cherished base that he represents. Uh, but I just do want to follow up on that because you said no one wants to see a former president indicted. Do you feel that that's true, even if the person might be guilty? Well, I mean, listen, I, even if they are guilty, sure. I mean, it's a sad day for America. Uh, take a step back, really. It's a sad day for America. For the first time in our nation's off, awesome history, we have now a, a, a former president who's been charged with a crime. That's, that's pretty stunning. And that's a huge development. And so in that respect, it is a sad day for America. So in that respect, nobody wants to see a former president charged. But if it's happened and, and, and the, the uh, facts warrant the charges, you have to let the facts play out and let the president have his former president have his day in court. Former Congressman John Katko, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. And now I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley, a professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, ABC News is reporting that sources say there appear to be at least seven counts here, ranging from the willful retention of national defense information to conspiracy to a crime to concealed documents to false statements and representations. Explain the significance of those types of charges in particular. Well, we know from the affidavit that was filed with the warrant um, giving rise to the search of Mar-a-Lago that back then in August of 2022, the FBI believed there was evidence at Mar-a-Lago of potential violations of the Espionage Act, which means that some of these documents might include national security information, uh, that they believed that he retained unlawfully classified information, that's a sep uh, information that's a separate charge, and third, obstruction of an FBI investigation, because we know 18 months went by before the FBI got to the point where they had to actually secure this search warrant. Now, uh, additionally, if it's if this reporting is true that we have 
uh, a conspiracy charge, that means there would be either other defendants that are included in the indictment that had a meeting of the minds with the former president to um, engage in some other crime, or they could have just been named as unindicted co-conspirators. But that suggests that there was some kind of a, a sort of a deal or an understanding that they were collectively going to try to conceal this information from the FBI. Uh, and then, you know, in connection with all of these multiple conversations at, with the FBI and the National Archives and the Trump team, it would not surprise me that there would be just some falsifying information, charges that they basically, there are people, maybe even the president or president's uh, representatives that made false statements to the FBI and under 18 U.S.C. 1001. That's against the law. It's not okay to lie to the federal government in connection with a federal investigation. Uh, this is a federal indictment coming from the special counsel, Jack Smith. How does that land differently than, say, the earlier indictment that we saw here in New York uh, with the hush money payments allegedly made to, to porn star Stormy Daniels? Well, I think the big issue really from the, a constitutional standpoint is when in the timeline did Donald Trump no longer uh, uh, serve as the president of the United States? Because that is going to be a pivotal moment. Because after that time, when the baton officially moved to Joe Biden, he will not have any protections under Article Two of the Constitution, which gives a sitting president all kinds of goodies when it comes to the actions taken in the as as president of the United States, presidents have immunity from all kinds of things on the theory that they need to be able to make decisions on behalf of the American public without being sued. So I think that the the, the big distinction among many is that if there are some actions that took place while he was technically still president, uh, he will have some arguments that will be what lawyers call questions of first impression. That is, we've never seen an indictment of a former president. We've never seen this kind of activity. And those are the kinds of things that could delay a trial and end up, frankly, before the United States Supreme Court to decide what, where are the boundaries of conduct and misconduct within the White House. And I think that's really what we all need to keep in mind here. Whatever happens in this case is essentially either green lighting or putting up some stop signs for future presidents, whether that be Donald Trump, who's the, you know, the presumptive nom nominee for the Republican Party, a Democrat, or presidents in 10, 20, 30 years for our children and grandchildren. This is a moment where the Constitution is really uh, being sharpened uh, for the American people. Kim Whaley, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And now I want to bring in our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. Aaron, you're there in Florida tonight. This is the first time, as we've been saying, a president has been indicted on a federal level. First, just want to go back again. That distinction, the, the federal indictment versus the prior indictment that we saw here in Manhattan. Just give us a, a sense of how this is kind of leveled up, so to speak. Oh, it sure is, not only in terms of consequences because of the nature uh, of the charges, but also, Lindsay, symbolically, here is the former president of the United States who's going to appear here at federal court in Miami, be placed under arrest by the very government he was once elected to lead. It is just an extraordinary moment come Tuesday afternoon when he's due here at U.S. District Court. Uh, in in Miami here in downtown Miami and and when he does appear he or one of his attorneys will have to enter a plea of not guilty we assume given the way he's been reacting to this indictment on social media and all along the former president has denied that he has done anything wrong and tried to uh, compare it to other leaders of the country who have been found in retention of classified documents but this case uniquely focused on more than 300 documents with classified markings that were found at the former president's estate in West Palm Beach after he left office. And maybe more importantly, Lindsay, his efforts to potentially obstruct the investigation that the feds were conducting, not loudly. At first, they tried to do it quietly without any fanfare before they finally went into that raid that everybody saw back in, in August, almost a year ago. And you said already that his lawyer will have to enter a plea for him uh, on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. What else can we expect to happen inside the courtroom? 
Well, there, there's a, a, a standard process that won't take very long, but, but he will be treated just like any other criminal defendant in the federal system. He will arrive, he will be formally placed under arrest, booked and processed as a federal defendant, and then he will be, appear before a federal magistrate for arraignment. He's charged by indictment, so he will have to enter that plea. Either he or one of his attorneys will, will enter it for him. And that begins what could be a, a, a year-plus-long prosecution. There will be a schedule potentially laid out for him to try and, and fight some of the charges, get them dismissed. But only when he appears, Lindsay, will we potentially understand the full scope of what the former president is facing. We understand there are no plans to unseal this indictment tonight. And why is this all playing out in Florida, not Washington, D.C.? And is this perhaps a, a friendlier crowd for him that it is playing out in Florida and not D.C.? It could be a friendlier crowd, especially if this goes to trial and Trump is, is tried by, uh, or the case is heard by some of his peers who may well be neighbors of his in West Palm Beach. Perhaps he thinks that's going to be a, a friendlier crowd for him. Of course, there are probably plenty of, of Democrats in this part of South Florida as well. But it also represents perhaps a vote of confidence by the special counsel who may be so confident in his case that he's willing to bring it right in the former president's backyard. Ordinarily, the Justice Department prefers to bring criminal charges in the, the venue where the alleged crimes occurred. So by bringing the indictment here in Florida, Lindsay, it appears the special counsel is convinced uh, the bulk, if not all, of the crimes occurred in South Florida at the former president's estate, where the documents were found, where they were allegedly moved around, where they may have been placed uh, in locations that were not secure in violation of, of federal uh, guidelines and laws, and, and maybe even more importantly, that effort to potentially obstruct what, what the feds were doing to try to retrieve those documents. Aaron Katursky reporting for us in Miami. Aaron, thank you. Now I want to bring in political director Rick Klein. Rick joins us now to talk about the political implications of yet another indictment for former President Donald Trump. Uh, Rick, obviously this is the second indictment, but this is a very different case. Will the GOP base still stand behind him? I was just uh, uh, reciting earlier what we heard from Pence earlier today, where he talked about how divisive this is for our country, how he thinks that this would send a terrible message to the wider world. Tim Scott uh, pretty much uh, giving the same kind of idea that they were against uh, these charges coming forward. Yeah, and Vivek Ramaswamy put out a statement just moments ago saying that he would pardon Donald Trump, another presidential candidate jumping into the fray on this. Uh, one of the outliers on this um, has been uh, go former Governor Asa Hutchison. He says that the RNC should even go so far as to change its own rules to clarify that you don't have to pledge to support someone who might be indicted. We also heard tonight from, from former Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey who says that these are clearly serious charges. He's looking at this and saying if the prosecutors feel like it was a case to bring, that has to be respected. But the, the point that you raise, Lindsay, is a very relevant one right now. We are already in the midst of a, a very active presidential campaign that will only heat up in the months to come as court dates and further information comes out about now two different sets of criminal charges and counting. We still are waiting on, on potential other charges out of, a, 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 out of the, the, the district attorney down in, um, down in Georgia. Uh, but we know that the information out there is already starting to weigh on Donald Trump. Whether it weighs on voters the same way becomes, becomes the larger question politically. There's been nothing that's happened so far in the way that the, the, the last round of criminal charges uh, developed that, that seemed to penetrate anything of his core base. But the argument from some Republicans is that all of this together, taken together, amounts to baggage that Republicans are going to start to recognize. Maybe this is not the guy they want to nominate. And of course, we can't separate the politics from all this, this indictment happening, as we were just saying, while the 2024 presidential race is happening. What kind of ripple effect will this have? We know you've been talking about how uh, there is no, there's nothing other than, you know, you have to be born in the United States in a certain age. You could become president, but you could be uh, charged, convicted and in a jail cell, really, and, and still run for president. It, truly, Lindsay, there's nothing in the federal law, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that you can't run 
even while under indictment, even if you were to be convicted, and even if you were to be in prison to, to get a couple of steps ahead of ourselves here. Uh, but it is hard as a practical matter to, to mount a defense at the same time as you're mounting a campaign. There's going to be court appearances now, potentially in two different states, maybe even a third state that he would have to keep, presumably, uh, to, to keep the, the engine of justice going. Uh, and of course, the legal bills and, and the, the, the distraction around it would all be playing out at the same time. I think what I'm going to have my eye on from here is how some of these other candidates start to, to craft their message on this, because you saw most of the candidates, basically all of the candidates, um, easily dismiss the New York charges um, as, as political rhetoric. They thought they were they were well beyond what should be uh, brought by a prosecutor. But as details come out of this case, if this case is anywhere near as, lock, as rock solid as prosecutors seem to think it is, and talking to our analysts about it, then this is going to be very hard uh, to, to defend on its merits. Uh, and I think politically speaking, it's going to potentially give some voters some pause about this. Uh, it's going to be up to Republican voters who they want to nominate. But the question that's going to be raised by Chris Christie and uh, as well as Mike Pence and, and other candidates is, is this the kind of um, candidate you want? If he, if he stands accused of these things and what that means for his governance, what it means for his electability, all of that becomes real and relevant. Rick Klein, our thanks to you as always. So much more to get to tonight. The former president of the United States and frontrunner for the Republican nomination in the 2024 election, becoming the first former commander in chief to be federally indicted. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. We are joined now by ABC News political contributor and former Trump Justice Department official Sarah Isker. Sarah, thank you so much for talking with us tonight. As you know, this is the second indictment. This comes during a campaign for yet another term in the White House. He has made uh, fighting the charges really the centerpiece of his campaign. How could this help or, or hurt his chances at the nomination? Well, what we're really all waiting to see is how other 2024 Republican presidential candidates respond to this. We've already seen uh, Vivek Ramaswamy say that he would pardon the president. Of course, Chris Christie, Asa Hutchison saying that this really should be a deal breaker. Chris Christie saying these are serious charges. Uh, on the other hand, what we're really looking for is what does a candidate like Ron DeSantis do? You're already hearing from Republican, uh, you know, grass tips, if you will, say that other Republicans should drop their campaigns and support Donald Trump, that this shows um, a lack of even handedness in, uh, you know, our systems of justice. So we'll really find out where the Republican nomination fight is, I think, in the next few days and how they respond. But there's no question that I think in the short term, this is a big help to Donald Trump. He's already fundraising off of it. And for right now, it means all of the attention is once again focused on him. If Ron DeSantis, for instance, wants to make inroads with Republican primary voters, he needed to take Trump voters away from Trump to move them in a different direction. But now for the next several days, weeks, maybe months, it's all going to be about Donald Trump once again. If you get out your crystal ball for us, I mean, what do you think about the, the Republican base here? Do people continue to support Trump? 
I think that what we've seen so far is that this information was already largely baked in for the Republican electorate. They knew about the classified documents. They knew about the special counsel investigation. And the line that you're going to hear most, I think, from the Trump campaign and from his allies is that there's a certain amount of hypocrisy here, that uh, all sorts of Democrats had retained classified information and weren't charged. Now, of course, the facts are quite different, but it will have a sense of a different type of justice and that Donald Trump has been a target of Democratic prosecutors, whether it's New York or the Department of Justice, and that's going to rally his base around him. Uh, the former president has less Republican allies than he once did, clearly, but, but still does have the support in the party. At what point do those remaining allies start to distance themselves? We certainly haven't seen it yet. Again, I'm very curious how the other Republican candidates will respond to this. Um, you know, Mike Pence started his campaign by attacking Donald Trump for his actions on January 6th. How is he going to respond to this, given that he himself was investigated for retaining classified information and not charged? Um, how will Ron DeSantis, currently the front runner of the rest of the Republican field, respond to this? Nikki Haley, Tim Scott. I think there's a lot of hesitation to attack Donald Trump, something that we saw in 2016. Of course, I was running Carly Fiorina's campaign then, and instead of attacking Trump, most of the candidates spent their time attacking the other non-Trump candidates. It was not an effective way to run the campaign, obviously. Donald Trump sailed into the nomination and eventually won the presidency. Sarah Isker, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Now I want to bring in our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Uh, Terry, just give us a sense of the historical significance of a former president facing a federal indictment like this. You know, you can't think of anything that parallels it. Uh, there were former presidents who disgraced themselves. John Tyler joined the Confederacy. He had been president of the United States. He, he joined the rebellion and, in fact, served uh, in the Confederate Congress. Uh, Andrew Johnson you know, left office in disgrace after he was a drunk and, uh, and did not handle Reconstruction very well, but he was later returned to office in Tennessee. So you can't think of another president with the sole exception of Richard Nixon, who was pardoned by his successor, Gerald Ford, for uh, any crimes that he would have committed during the Watergate scandal. And Ford did it to, he said, spare the country the trauma of the trial of a former president. Uh, that's not going to happen this time. Joe Biden has stayed out of this. He's going to continue to stay out of it. And so we are likely to see, unless uh, Trump pleads guilty and cuts some kind of deal where there's no indication of that either, we are going to see a former president of the United States on trial by the government that he once ran. And, and there is no precedent for that. But there's one thing that really abides in, in American politics, and that's change. It's not 2016 anymore. It's not 2020 anymore. The American people have a remarkable ability to self-correct, to absorb new circumstances, and decides what, what is best for them and their families in the moment and for tomorrow. We're a tomorrow country. There'll be millions and millions of people who will, you know, go to the nth degree to defend Donald Trump, but there'll be millions more who say, what else is out there? That's just in the American character. So we have this extraordinary and unprecedented trial, uh, and it will all depend, really, how it goes politically on how it goes legally, not just a conviction or an acquittal or, or whatever happens, but how the justice system operates. Polls show that Americans are losing trust in the courts. This is a moment for the courts to demonstrate they can do something, even this e extraordinary and unprecedented, in a way that people can trust. I put this in perspective as far as the, the different weight of, of a special counsel making a federal prosecution like this versus what we've seen in the New York indictment with the allegations of the hush money paid to the porn star Stormy Daniels. Well, Jack Smith isn't elected. He was appointed because he is a veteran prosecutor in national security affairs. Alvin Bragg ran for office in part by signaling to uh, New York voters that he would go after Donald Trump. Uh, that indictment, really, and that legal process bears the burden of that taint, that political taint that he ran for office, essentially promising a, a criminal prosecution. Jack Smith, I don't know if anybody's noticed, he hasn't said a word. He hasn't said a thing.
publicly. He's just gone about his business, and now his work product is coming before us. The indictment of the former president, and he is known as a prosecutor who gets his ducks in a row, who amasses his evidence. You do not want to be at the receiving end of a Jack Smith indictment, of a federal indictment in general. Uh, and so this is going to be really a, a, a test for the federal process, but for the courts at, at large. And Jack Smith has started it off in as clean a way as he could. A secret uh, process and now the indictment. And Jack Smith doesn't have to say a word. Certainly the indictment speaks for itself. Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. To be America's number one news, it takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from the nation's capital, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. You were saying that this is the room where he passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bed hard. was right there. Getting rid of it, it was hard. It was really hard. It's in this room that Regina Denny watched her teenage son take his last breath. Why is it so important for you to keep so many memories in this room? It makes me feel close to him. One of my biggest fears is that he'll be forgotten. 
His life was just getting started. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had plans. Those plans tragically cut short in October 2018. Brian just 17 years old when he died in his Indianapolis home. The cause, something Regina didn't even think was dangerous, never mind deadly. He was a sweet kid. He was funny. If you were sad, you weren't sad around him for very long because he would do the silliest stuff to make you smile. Like many teens, he loved fishing, basketball, drive-in movies. <laughs> and he was a devoted uncle to his nephew, Zayden. But in the spring of 2018, Regina watched as her son's health declined. Tell me when he first started getting sick. The first time that I noticed the vomiting was April 7th. He was vomiting so much that he said he was feeling tingling in his face and his, his hands. When you talk him to the doctors, what did they think? They took Brian ahead of me. I came in and he had IVs in both arms. Um, he was on oxygen. They said that the muscle contraction was a, an anxiety attack from all the vomiting. Did they run a bunch of tests? Mm -hmm. What were they looking um, for? Anything. Um, they did say he was dehydrated. Um, his kidneys had went into failure. And he's 17, mm -hmm. healthy. Yeah. A complete medical mystery. He had, had lost pro probably about 30 pounds in a little over a month. Then, as I was talking to the ER doctor, another doctor happened to walk past our room. And she put her head through the door and she said, um, do you smoke marijuana? And Brian kind of looked at me and I was like, look, be honest. And he said, yeah. And she said, does hot showers and baths help? And he said, yeah. And she said, you have CHS. CHS or cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It's rare. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is a relatively unique condition that we see with patients who use relatively large amounts of marijuana. Patients who suffer from this condition have recurrent bouts of vomiting and abdominal pain. They're terrifically symptomatic and they can get very, very sick. ER Dr. Sam Torbati says he's seen an increasing number of CHS cases come through the doors at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. But diagnosing the condition isn't easy. There's no test that we can do. There's no blood test. It doesn't show up on a CAT scan. I can't really show you an image to say this is what cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome looks like. One Canadian study found that CHS-related ER visits there increased 13-fold over seven years. Researchers point out that during this time, commercial sales of marijuana exploded, and so too did the variety of cannabis products available. Dr. Torbati says more studies need to be done. We became more and more aware of this condition because more and more people are now using marijuana products. Marijuana products now have far more THC, which we believe is the main chemical compound responsible for this. In the U.S., cannabis samples seized by the DEA found that potency rose from 4% in the mid-90s to 12% 20 years later. And during that time, the ratio of THC to CBD increased from 14 to 80 times greater. For years, marijuana has been used both recreationally and medically to fight chronic pain and nausea. But for some, it's actually triggering the opposite effect, which is why, in part, CHS is often overlooked or misdiagnosed. I ended up in the hospital. Um, I was there for two and a half weeks, constantly vomiting. <laughs> Erica Hagler first became sick in August of 2018. She was living just outside of Boston at the time, a city known for its top-notch medical care. How hard was it for you to get a diagnosis? They tested me for everything else underneath the sun, and I do mean everything, and they couldn't find a diagnosis. So Erica says she went home and did her own research. That's when she came across CHS on the internet. Eventually, she says, a doctor confirmed the diagnosis. Erica says she gave up marijuana immediately. How hard was it for you to stop? Well, once I knew it was killing me, um, I, it was immediate. But for most people, it's not that easy. 
As Erica began to recover, she started a support group on Facebook called CHS Recovery. It now has more than 20,000 members. When I was on my deathbed in the hospital, I was sitting there praying to God, like, please just get me out of here, get me healthy. I swear that I will help other people. She's connected with people all over the world who are going through the same painful process. People are sharing their experiences. It's pretty graphic. Very graphic. I mean, it's not unusual to see all these graphic images. And so a lot of people suffer burns. Why is that? The burns come from hot showers. Scalding hot showers, something many who suffer from CHS say relieves their symptoms, at least temporarily. Some doctors believe this is because of what possibly triggers symptoms in CHS patients. They say when THC and CBD bind with certain receptors in the body repeatedly, it can spark a severe vomiting or nausea reaction. It's thought that applying scalding heat might trigger something in those same receptors that improves symptoms. What do you tell people who think this will never get better? It does get better. You just have to stay abstinent, take care of yourself. While there isn't a cure for CHS, doctors say patients need to give up marijuana to start feeling better. Patients will say, well, I stopped for two weeks and I didn't get better, so it must not be this condition that you're labeling me with. And we, we educate and say, really, you're going to need to stop for months. Regina says her son Brian agreed to give up marijuana for 45 days. But when the symptoms didn't let up, he got frustrated and started smoking again. That was upsetting, I'm sure. Yeah, I thought maybe there was something else wrong. But Brian would ultimately succumb to complications of CHS just six months after his diagnosis on that fateful fall day. I called his doctor and I told his doctor, I feel like I'm slowly watching my son die. She said that she would call in a prescription for nausea medicine and that the only thing, other thing she could tell me is send him to rehab. So I told Brian, you have to quit or I'm, I'm gonna have to do this because I can't do, I cannot watch you die. He says, uh, mom, I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna quit. And I thought, okay. This is, we're, we're going to be okay. But it was too late. He grabs his back. And instinctively, I thought, kidneys. I called 911, and Brian looks at me, and he says, Mom, I can't breathe. And he took his last breath. I remember praying so hard and begging God to take me instead of him. The paramedic came out of the room and she didn't even have to tell me. I could tell by her face that he was gone. It wasn't until the autopsy report came back that Regina came to terms with what had caused his death. Dehydration due to cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. I had to process that because weed doesn't kill you, but it did. In the five years since Brian's death, Regina has dedicated herself to raising awareness about CHS. Why do you feel so strongly that you want to keep telling Brian's story? Because I don't want another family to go through what we have. Because my son deserves to be remembered. He's making an impact. He's saving people's lives. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. 
Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You can't believe I'd do this deal. What's it like being back on Broadway? It's wonderful. I mean, it's. I grew up doing musical theater. I was like five years old, and my parents would play show tunes in the car. I read that you were singing songs from Parade in the car when you were a kid. Definitely. We had a compilation. I remember not quite knowing the context for it, and I went to see it, and I was just really fascinated and haunted by the whole story and the realization that it was true. <laughs> Now, 20 years later, Ben Platt, the Broadway baby, is belting out those same tunes in the revival of Parade. It follows the story of Leo Frank, a Jewish factory manager who was falsely accused of killing a 13-year-old female worker and ultimately lynched by a white mob. I never touched that child, God. I never What's it like to breathe life into Leo's story and put it on Broadway now? There's a lot of things that he stands for, but there's not a lot about him as a three-dimensional human being and honoring that person. People come in expecting a period piece, and it is, but as the show progresses and moves forward, it, it, it feels less and less that way and more and more contemporary. For those that have never seen it before, it doesn't even really feel like a revival. Art right. as social commentary has always been central to Ben Platt's craft. When you're falling in a it's been six years since his Broadway breakout in the musical smash, Dear Evan Hansen. Make a sound when you're falling in a forest and there's nobody around, do you ever really crash? The show's core message, acceptance, tackling tough issues like loneliness and suicide. My dream has always been to be part of this community. And it came true really young with Dear Evan Hansen, you know, when I was 22, 23, and... Tony Award-winning <laughs> performance. Pretty wild, still, to me. And so I, you know, I always hoped that I'd be able to return. I think my only fear after that experience was, like, how do I come back and not disappoint? And he hasn't. Parade picking up six Tony nominations, including Best Actor, raising Jewish visibility. Something Platt doubled down on with a fashionable Star of David at the Met Gala. I mean, I think this whole experience of doing Parade has really helped me to embrace my specific Jewish identity. I just have been feeling very prideful because of everything we've been through with the show. 
but he's also full of pride, leaning into his LGBTQ identity. As a songwriter singing about the love of his life, fiance Noah Galvin in songs like Imagine. What's it like to stand at this intersection of these two communities that are under assault in some ways? I think it's kind of a rare intersection in the sense that there isn't a lot of specifically queer Jewish representation. For me, it's just about trying to be as completely forthright about the truths of my identity as I can and then just make art with those as the backdrop. Oh. His character, Leo Frank's story, sheds light on the history of anti-Semitism, which is timely, given that attacks against the Jewish community are increasing. You want to learn about the truth about that you're going to see tonight? You're paying 300 bucks to go worship a hell. You might as well know what you're talking about. On opening night of previews in February, hate would be right outside the theater doors. A far-right neo-Nazi group protesting, handing out flyers with hateful rhetoric. And to have that happen on the first night, it just kind of snapped us all back to reality. What reflections have you had about what that protest means? There has been many different moments in which the universe has let me know that this is the right place and the right time and the right piece and the right story for me to be telling in this moment. Like, this is very urgent and this needs to happen now. The Leo Frank trial was a wrenching moment for the country. Jonathan Greenblatt is CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, an organization fighting anti-Semitism and hate, which was founded in the wake of Leo Frank's conviction. Leo Frank was subjected to ugly, just repellent anti-Semitism. Here was a man who clearly had been wronged, who was being rushed through the system. He didn't have due process. And it generated a media frenzy. The modern ADL still tracks anti-Semitic attacks across the U.S., recording some 3,697 incidents in 2022 alone, the highest number on record since the ADL began tracking more than four decades ago. Frank was sentenced to death in what was seen as a sham trial. But after national backlash, the Georgia governor eventually commuted his sentence to life in prison. An anti-Semitic mob filled with very well-known politicians and members of the press and all sorts of, of men sprung him from his cell and uh, lynched him. But Leo Frank's case also led to a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan at a time when countless lynchings were mostly targeting African Americans. In the year that Leo Frank was lynched, I think there's something like 200 members of the black community who are lynched in this country. Although Frank was pardoned posthumously, all these years later, there's still work to be done. Seeing the Gentile community also really show up and also really right. be ready to like receive it. As for what's yeah, next for Ben Platt, the artist, the he says it'll be production. rooted in the here and now. Like I am going to work on a new album and hopefully get to tour that. Anytime I spend time in a character like Leo Frank, it, it makes me hungry to spend some time as myself, expressing my own perspective. You are quite literally living the dream. <laughs> Knock wood. <laughs> <laughs> Our thanks to Juju. And if you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide, call or text the National Lifeline at 988. You are not alone. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Losing my daughter and that attack, it was horrible. Even after seven years, the loss for Beatriz Gonzalez and Jose Hernandez is profound. It's sad in a way uh, because she's not here. But at the same time, uh, you know, um, we like to talk about how she lived. Naomi Gonzalez was the 23-year-old light of their lives, a junior at Cal State University Long Beach studying industrial design and the first in her Mexican-American family to attend college. Very independent, responsible, punctual. She had everything that we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> But in November 2015, tragedy struck in Paris. My friend called me and she told me, did you hear about the news that uh, Paris has been attacked for the ISIS? 
ISIS terrorists on a rampage across the city. Hours later, they learned the horrific news that Naomi was one of 130 killed and the only American. I never thought that something is going to happen to her. I could never imagine it. Never. Last summer, the French convicted and sentenced 20 people connected to the attack, but the Gonzalez family says they want broader accountability. In a lawsuit filed in 2016, they allege YouTube parent company Google gave material support to ISIS by not only allowing the group to post videos, but by promoting them through algorithms that recommend content to other users. If some changes can be done, that is a big thing. But Gonzalez has been unable to even make the case in court because of a landmark law known as Section 230 of the Federal Communications Decency Act, which gives sweeping immunity to social media companies. Section 230 has been referred to variously as the law that created the modern Internet, uh, the most important law in the Internet. It protects companies like Twitter, Google and Facebook from being sued for photos, video and commentary uploaded by users or for the company's decisions to moderate content on their sites. They get to decide what to carry, they get to decide what not to carry and they get to decide how to design their algorithms uh, to amplify certain types of content or to de-emphasize other types of content. When this statute was enacted in 1996, it was for the express purpose of protecting kids from seeing obscene material online and protecting companies who take obscene material offline to protect kids. And it's been turned on its head. The Gonzalez family argues algorithms which spread users' content shouldn't qualify for immunity. And next month, they'll make that case at the U.S. Supreme Court. This is the first time ever uh, the Supreme Court has weighed in on uh, 230. What would that mean for your clients if, if in fact, the Supreme Court were to roll back 230? It will certainly provide a more sensible opportunity uh, for, uh, for families to hold companies accountable. It will simply kind of open the courthouse door. YouTube says it bans terrorist content and that its algorithms help catch and remove violent extremist videos, saying 95% removed last year were automatically detected. A spokesperson telling ABC News undercutting Section 230 would make it harder for websites to do this work, making services far less useful, less open, and less safe. The uh, change in the liability rule will likely create far greater uh, litigation risk. You could see far more dangerous content online because companies would be afraid to moderate. The tech industry says it could upend the Internet as we know it. Some companies are going to over-sanitize their services and they'll, they'll err on the side of caution. And others, meanwhile, are just going to stick their heads in the sand and they'll abdicate completely. Francis Haugen, the former Facebook insider and algorithmic specialist turned congressional whistleblower, says there is a middle ground. My fear is that without action, Divisive and extremist behaviors we see today are only the beginning. Warning that algorithms can harm Americans and that companies need to be more transparent and accountable. The challenge of these systems is that people are drawn, you know, our hindbrains pull us towards more extreme content. So you can start out by looking at something very moderate, like something like healthy eating, and just by clicking on the content presented, uh, get led to eat pro-eating disorder content. How easily can companies modify these algorithms to, 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 to mitigate some of these harms. We have tools, but all these things decrease usage. You know, they make the companies a little bit less money. And in a world where our business models are fueled by clicking on ads, there aren't independent, just market incentives for making products that help people be healthy and happy. For years, Congress has debated changes to Section 230. President Biden, in a recent Wall Street Journal op-ed, called for an end to the liability shield for Internet companies. But there isn't a consensus on the way forward. What happens in a world where YouTube is responsible? That's a really hard question. But people were exposed to this information who would not have been exposed to it if these recommender systems hadn't put it in right, right in front of them. No digital service wants their products to be used by bad actors. But to try to use liability here is actually going to produce uh, the, a contrary result. As we join the Gonzalez family on a visit to Naomi's gravesite, her parents told us they want the Supreme Court to help seek justice for their loss. What do you hope comes from this case at the end of the day? 
We just hope that uh, hopefully by by this it, it'll change the laws and it'll be for the good. So they don't never have the pain that we're feeling. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following breaking news at this hour involving former President Trump. If you're just joining us, here's what we know right now. Sources tell ABC News former President Trump has been indicted on at least seven federal counts. ABC News has confirmed Donald Trump and his lawyers have been told that the former president needs to be in federal court in Miami on Tuesday at 3 p.m. to process on federal charges. This, of course, would be the very first former president ever to be indicted on federal charges. This investigation has been more than a year in the making. Special counsel Jack Smith's office has been gathering evidence since November on two fronts, classified documents and on the events leading up to and including January 6th. Less than 24 hours ago, we learned the former president had recently received a letter from the special counsel's office officially informing him that he was the target of an ongoing investigation. And that, of course, signaled that this could be coming. And on Tuesday, we will see what will amount to another unprecedented scene. Trump will be placed under arrest by the same government that he was formally elected to lead. So what comes next and what is the former president and his team saying tonight? Our team is reporting this story out for us and we begin with our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, a federal grand jury has voted to indict Donald Trump in the special counsel's investigation into his handling of classified documents. Prosecutors telling the former president he will be arraigned in Miami on Tuesday. And sources telling ABC News Trump is facing multiple counts ranging from illegal retention of government documents to conspiracy to obstruction of the government's efforts to retrieve those documents. The indictment marks the first time an American president has faced federal charges. Tonight, Trump reacting on his social media site saying he never thought it possible that such a thing could happen, calling it a dark day. The former president insisting all along he's done nothing wrong. All I know is this. Everything I did was right. We have the Presidential Records Act, which I abided by 100 percent. After leaving the White House, Trump spent months haggling with the National Archives over whether he had, in fact, returned all government records as required by law. The Justice Department then obtaining a court-ordered subpoena. 
But when the FBI learned Trump still had sensitive records, despite his team's insistence that they had turned everything over, agents raided his home at Mar-a-Lago, seizing more than 100 classified documents. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. Trump has argued that he declassified any material that he took from the White House. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. But Trump's attorneys have offered no specific evidence in court that records were declassified. And prosecutors clearly believe they have evidence that proves otherwise, including Donald Trump on tape, allegedly admitting he held on to sensitive material. Uh, and now, uh, our thanks to Pierre Thomas for that. Now I'd like to bring in our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. Aaron, uh, you're in Florida tonight. This is the first time a president has been indicted, as we've been saying, on a federal level. Uh, what can we expect to happen inside that courtroom on Tuesday? Well, once the former president arrives here at the U.S. District Courthouse in downtown Miami on Tuesday afternoon, Lindsay, he will be treated like any other federal defendant, booked and processed but first placed under arrest by the very government that he was elected to lead. What an extraordinary moment it will be for the country. Uh, the former president uh, is then expected to appear before a magistrate judge to enter a plea to the charges based on how he's reacted on social media tonight. We would expect that plea to be not guilty. And that will touch off a months-long prosecution that will undoubtedly run headlong uh, into the presidential campaign. And why is this all playing out in Florida, not Washington, D.C.? The Justice Department prefers to, to charge defendants in the jurisdiction where they believe the crimes occurred. And so here, Special Counsel Jack Smith believes, it appears, that the, the crime of unlawfully retaining documents was committed in Florida at the former president's golf club in West Palm Beach and also the effort potentially to interfere with the government's attempt to retrieve those documents also occurred here in South Florida at the former president's estate. It is also perhaps a sign of confidence, Lindsay, that the special counsel believes he can bring these charges in the former president's backyard. And the Southern District of Florida has a so-called rocket docket status for its speedy proceedings. Explain what that could mean for this case. Well, many of the judges uh, abide by the, the speedy trial clock, which means that they could start and finish cases in a period of, of six months, which not, may, may not sound like very speedy, but, but for a federal case, it, it typically takes a year or longer. That could well uh, be to Trump's advantage if he wants to get it uh, over and done with and, and then on to the, to the campaign. But that's going to be up to the judge, and we don't know what judge would ultimately hear it or what legal tactics the former president might try to employ to get the charges either dismissed or downgraded. And we know from his prior appearances in court, Lindsay, he often tries to delay proceedings against him. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you. Now I'd like to bring in ABC's John Santucci, who's covered the former president since the start of his 2016 campaign. Thanks so much, uh, John, for joining us. Okay, so just break down what we know as far as, as specific as we can get as mm -hmm. these seven charges. So we know at least seven charges are in this indictment. It's been handed up from this grand jury in Southern Florida. This is all about documents, the retention of classified information that Donald Trump took to Florida. So we know at least one of those charges specifically references keeping classified information, but it also is a conspiracy. So we don't know if other people are involved in this. I think that's really important, Lindsay. And one thing from talking to folks that have been around the former president for much of today, they are trying to understand right now, is this just Donald Trump? Are there other people that have brought into this? Because we have to remember, they have been focused on a grand jury in Washington, D.C. for the better part of the year. This indictment is out of Florida. We only learned that this grand jury in Florida was active within just the last couple mm -hmm. of days. So this is a bit of a mystery at the moment. I can tell you for the moment right now what we know for sure, there is a huddle, all hands on deck in Bedminster, everybody around the former president trying to figure this out. And, and we know that Trump himself actually said, yes, I have been indicted. Mm -hmm. He released a statement on his social media platform. What else is he saying? You know, he has said a lot in there. A lot of it is, is misinformation. But I think the two lines that stuck out to me, he has called this a dark day, but he said that he never thought this was possible. Lindsay, I got to tell you something. 
that one just doesn't pass the truth test. It's something that when we're talking to the former president's aides, advisors, his lawyers, his campaign staff, because obviously he's launched his third campaign, this is the one he knew was coming. And in part because he has watched so many people go into that grand jury in D.C. He watched his longtime spokesperson go into the Florida grand jury just 24 hours ago. But also think about the amount of guests that have been at Mar-a-Lago for the last year. Not guests coming for a party, guests coming to search. The raid, we remember that. We were all on the air together last August seeing federal agents probe all across Mar-a-Lago. But the number of times that we know prosecutors have reached out to Team Trump, we know there's more here. We need to keep hunting. Team Trump even going out and hiring their own firm to go look around Mar-a-Lago, look around underneath the pool where there's a hidden secret closet where he kept some of these documents. And obviously, Lindsay, every time you can't make it up, they found something. Uh, you talked about how they, they're all huddling at this point at Bedminster. Yeah. Uh, give us a sense if we've heard anything from those who are closest to Trump about just how serious this could be. Extremely serious. Now, we know, you know, obviously not knowing the full details of this indictment, we know from the reporting by Pierre Thomas and our colleagues, this is going to be revealed in a spoken indictment very soon. So there is a little bit of guessing going on at the moment. But, you know, seven federal counts, they mean business. This is something that is real. And we should note that, you know, obviously Donald Trump and his team have known for some time that this was coming because of the activity with the grand jury, but that target letter, they were told within just the last couple of weeks, you, Donald Trump, you are a target of a criminal investigation. And I can tell you, Lindsay, from talking to folks around the former president, everybody got a little more tense when they learned that. And, and John, we're out of time, but I just got to say, you know, somebody, you've been covering him since 2016. Any chance that you think that this derails his campaign? 2015. 2015. Um, I don't think so. I think that Donald Trump is determined. I think Donald Trump is out there. We've seen them already a campaign message out there to raise money. He's going full throttle. John Santucci, our thanks to you as always. Now I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley, a professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. ABC News is reporting that sources say there appear to be at least seven counts here ranging from the willful retention of national defense information to conspiracy to a scheme to conceal documents to false statements and representations. Explain the significance of these types of charges. So we already have one indictment out of Manhattan. That's local crimes alleged relating uh, to falsifying business records. This has to do with the federal government, potential national security information, the Espionage Act. And so the concern here and the meta level is that he put the security of the United States potentially at risk by taking these documents out of the White House and taking them to Mar-a-Lago and keeping them there. And then there are charges apparently having to do with obstructing the process, not telling the truth to the FBI, not turning over information, hiding it, concealing it, things like that. I think when he talks about the Presidential Records Act, uh, Donald Trump, let's just, let's just be, be clear. After Watergate, Congress passed a law that made clear that these kinds of records don't belong to any one person. They belong to the American people. That's in the Presidential Records Act. And I think that's what Donald Trump just kind of miffed in this moment. ABC News has learned that we can expect a speaking indictment on Tuesday. What exactly does that mean? Well, all that's really required in an indictment technically is notice. What are we charging you with? So it could just include the alleged crime, the statute. A speaking indictment is sort of a story. It means that uh, Jack Smith, if that is what happens, will sort of tell the once upon a time story, step by step, of what he claims or the grand jury believes potentially Donald Trump did to violate seven statutory provisions and the evidence, walking through the evidence that gave rise to the conclusion that Donald Trump and I believe Jack Smith and his team believes did this beyond a reasonable doubt because that's the standard at trial. They have to be sure almost 99% that they've got the goods on Donald Trump. It's not a maybe, it's not a 50-50 thing. It's a very high percentage. So I think he understands the constitutional implications and will want kind of the, the media and the American people to understand from out of the gate why he took this extraordinary step, this historical step. Kim Whaley, we so appreciate your time and insight tonight.
Now Thank I you, want to Lindsay. bring in uh, political director Rick Klein, who joins us now to talk about the political implications of a yet another indictment for former President Donald Trump. Uh, Rick, this is the second indictment for him, uh, but this is a very different case altogether. Will the GOP base still stand behind him now a second time? Yeah, Lindsay, this is potentially much more consequential, and I think it'll be a bigger test to the Republican base. The case in New York was a lot easier to ascribe political motivations to. You had uh, prosecutors there, you have prosecutors there who are using kind of a novel legal, legal theory, trying to suggest that uh, the hush money payments to a, a porn star that he was alleged to have an affair with was, was a campaign finance violation that, that merited uh, felony charges. It, it's a hard case to make. It, it makes a lot of assumptions, and there's a lot about that case we don't know. This case, on the other hand, we know a lot about, and if, the, if, if what we're told about it is true, we're talking about very serious charges in multiple directions and an all-encompassing investigation that, have to, that, that, that really run the gamut of the retention of the documents, as well as uh, attempts to obstruct efforts to, uh, alleged attempts to try to obstruct efforts to, to get them back, uh, lying to people along the way about it. It adds up to a much more serious challenge, and I think the accumulated weight itself, Lindsay, adds up to a more serious challenge because you're not just talking about one set of charges that you can argue the former president is set to beat. You're talking about federal charges. Federal prosecutors rarely miss when they take swings this big, uh, and that is something that Republican voters are going to have to be thinking about in the months ahead. And, Rick, of course, you can't separate the politics from all this. This indictment happening while the 2024 presidential race is now ongoing. Uh, what kind of ripple effect can we expect that this will have? We've already seen statements from a number of candidates expressing support for Donald Trump, saying this is a politicized indictment. But we saw, we saw already former Governor Asa Hutchison of Arkansas calling again on Donald Trump to get out of the race. You've also seen uh, Chris Christie, a longtime ally of the former president, saying, look, if these charges are real as a former prosecutor, uh, if, the, if the allegations are true, then you have to get the charges uh, through the system, that the, the same kind of rule of law has to apply to everybody equally. So even though I think some of the defense is out there among the Republican base, you're starting to see some people begin to make a, a little more nuanced case that, look, whatever you think about Donald Trump as a person, whatever you think about his history, whether that's January 6th, the attempts to overturn the election, his first impeachment, the second impeachment, that he's got now political baggage that's getting to be pretty sizable. And no one's voted yet, Lindsay. We're still six, seven months away from the start of the primary process, two and a half months away from the beginning of the debate season, uh, and no decisions and no choices have been made. And there are choices that the other candidates are going to be making. So I'm not buying for one second that he's politically bulletproof just because he survived scandals before. Uh, this may be different, or it may be that the weight of all of this is different. Rick Klein, our thanks to you as always. Now I want to bring in Rachel Scott, who joins us from Iowa. Rachel, you were on the trail today with former Vice President Mike Pence. All of these candidates certainly uh, trying to, to walk a fine line here. Uh, right before uh, the, the indictment came down, Pence had already spoken out, saying how divisive it would be. Uh, what is he saying at this point? Yeah, former Vice President Mike Pence was right here in Iowa. I actually pressed him about the multiple ongoing investigations into the former president, his former boss, and I asked him if this is someone that should be representing the future of the Republican Party. And so Pence did make two things clear. One, he says that there needs to be new leadership, but then he went on to say that an indictment would only further divide the country. So he's not going as far as we are seeing candidates like Asa Hutchinson go, calling on the former president to end his campaign. At this point, there are nearly 12 candidates in the race right now, and Hutchinson is the only one that's going that far, calling on Trump to sort of put this all to an end. And, and Rachel, uh, Trump has already been defiant, uh, which I think we could all expect. He's fundraising off of this, though, at this point? Within minutes of this indictment being handed down to the former president, his campaign sent out an email blast calling on his supporters to donate. He is fundraising off of this once again. Now, this is something that we saw uh, with the last indictment that the former president got. Within minutes of that, he was also fundraising, raising millions of dollars. And if we look towards last time, we saw that 90 Republicans on Capitol Hill, six governors stood by former President Donald Trump. The big question does remain tonight as we continue continue to learn more about this indictment and what charges the former president faces, will that even break, Lindsay? All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. And still ahead here on Prime Hazardous smoke stretches throughout the Northeast as wildfires rip through Canada. The health warnings from officials as this toxic air sticks around. Plus, he's a lead suspect in the Natalie Holloway disappearance. Why Uren Vandersloot has been extradited to the U.S. Whenever.
Denver News breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Reporting from Ciudad Juarez on the U.S.-Mexico border, I'm Matt Rivers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The indictment of the former president is the top story of the night, but we want to bring you some other stories that we're following, including the hazardous air. Millions across the Northeast continue to breathe in where that air is now and when it can finally dissipate. Plus, your Aunt Vandersloot, chief suspect in the Natalie Holloway disappearance, arrives in the U.S. from Peru to face extortion and wire fraud charges, what Holloway's family is now saying. And Ukraine mounts a major counteroffensive against Russia in efforts to retake its captured land. But next to that toxic air from Canada putting 120 million Americans at risk tonight, a shift in the wind may provide some much needed relief for some, but that may just envelop new areas with all this smoke. The orange sky from the hazardous air reached all the way to Washington, D.C. today and even forced the White House to cancel a pride event. The smoke triggered an air quality emergency in Philadelphia and the shifting winds brought the smoke all the way to Cleveland. Smoke also caused major travel disruptions. So is any relief in sight? Rob Marciano is standing by with the forecast. But first, Trevor Ault has more on the air quality alerts for millions of Americans. Tonight, that monster plume of wildfire smoke spreading deeper into the U.S. After New York City registered what's likely its worst air quality of all time Wednesday, cities to the south and west from New Jersey and Pennsylvania to D.C. and beyond enveloped in that toxic haze. My daughter's got asthma really bad, so she's just stuck in the house. She can't really come out at all. Overnight, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania hitting 491 on the air quality index's 1 to 500 scale. Even worse than New York City's 484 on Wednesday. 
In Washington, D.C., the city's first code purple air quality advisory, signifying very unhealthy air. When they told me it was code purple, I thought it was getting better. So we're not even used to this language to deal with this type of air quality. Our Rob Marciano on the National Mall. Yesterday was bad, today even worse here in D.C. Smoke shrouding our nation's capital. At the other end of the mall, standing at 550 feet tall, the Washington Monument, can't even see it. The White House forced to postpone a pride event on the South Lawn that some 2,000 people were set to attend, and the Nationals calling off tonight's baseball game. In Newark, New Jersey, the state's largest school district canceling all classes. Health officials warning continued exposure to the particulates in the air is especially harmful to young children. This is because they breathe more air relative to their size and are more active than most adults. Parents now told to watch for signs like chest pain, shortness of breath, and wheezing. And the source of the smoke, those wildfires burning in Canada, hundreds of them still out of control in multiple parts of the country. The U.S. has sent assets and more than 600 firefighters to Canada so far. President Biden speaking with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, promising to send more air tankers and any additional help they need to put out the fires, calling them a stark reminder of the impacts of climate change. Our thanks to Trevor for that. Let's get straight to Rob Marciano. Rob, how long will all this smoke hang around? Well, it's, you know, we'll get some widespread relief, really not until, until next week. You'll see pockets of some clarity, but we're not going to get out of this for some time to come. As for yesterday, Lindsay, the results are in. When you talk about population density, it was the worst air quality our nation has seen as a whole since 2006. All right, let's get to those colorful maps we've grown accustomed to the, the past few days and track where this unhealthy air is going to. Pittsburgh, Buffalo, you're going to get more of it by tomorrow morning. Philadelphia, Baltimore, in through... Uh, and through southern Jersey, Delaware as well, and as far back as uh, Louisville and Columbus, Ohio, maybe even Fort Wayne, Indiana by tomorrow night. Uh, so we're not quite out of this for sure. But what will happen over the weekend, and some of this smoke will thin, but the air will still be unhealthy in many spots. A front's going to push toward us. It'll help break down that blocking pattern and bring a change in the wind speed and wind direction come Monday night, and hopefully some much needed range of those wildfires in Canada, but that's not till at least Monday or Tuesday. Lindsay? The skies behind you, I must say, though, do look a bit better than they've been looking the last few days. Rob, our thanks to you. Now to the Supreme Court and a major ruling that upheld the Voting Rights Act. The court found Alabama's newly drawn voter maps deny black voters a voice. Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh joined the liberal justices in the 5-4 to four decision. Alabama will now have to redraw its maps that could give Democrats another seat in the House, and the decision could lead to changes in other states as well. ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran reports. Tonight, a Supreme Court stunner. Two conservative justices, Chief Justice John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh, joined the court's liberals in striking down Alabama's congressional map that critics said diluted the power of black voters. In a 5-4 to four decision, the court upheld a lower court ruling that found a redistricting map drawn by the Republican-led Alabama legislature violated the Voting Rights Act because it only drew one district out of seven that had a majority of black voters, even though more than one in four Alabamians are black. In his opinion for the court, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that the Voting Rights Act does not permit a state to provide some voters less opportunity to participate in the political process. The court's ruling, Roberts added, rested on a fair reading of the record before us, adding that record contained undeniable evidence of Alabama's extensive history of repugnant racial and voting-related discrimination. In a fierce dissent, Justice Clarence Thomas said the approach Roberts and the liberals endorsed amounted to hijacking the districting process to pursue a goal that has no legitimate claim under our constitutional system, the proportional allocation of political power on the basis of race. Today's ruling will have immediate impacts. Another congressional district in Alabama with a majority black population and more. This is going to have an impact far beyond um, Alabama and will have an impact on who controls the United States House of Representatives after the 2024 election. Wide-reaching implications here. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, just give us a little more detail about how this ruling could have far-reaching implications beyond just the state of Alabama. 
Well, Lindsay, this ruling really does resuscitate the Voting Rights Act after the Supreme Court really diminished its importance 10 to Shelby County versus Holder. And it does so by making the redistricting the real battleground in voting rights cases. The Cook Political Report, uh, which analyzes and handicaps elections, has already today changed its ratings for five House races, moving each one of them towards the Democrats. And that's just the beginning. Uh, the Cook Political Report saying this really sends shockwaves right across the political landscape. Lindsay? It sure does. Terry Moran for us just outside the Supreme Court. Thanks so much, Terry. At least 19 children and one adult were injured when a boardwalk collapsed in Texas in Surfside Beach on the Gulf of Mexico. Multiple rescue helicopters rushed to the scene, transporting five people to the hospital. The injuries are said to be non-life-threatening. The cause of the collapse is under investigation. Overseas, a horrific knife attack in the French Alps targeted children. A man ran through a park and stabbed four young children between 22 months and three years old. One of the victims was in a stroller and was stabbed repeatedly. Here's James Longman. Tonight, the moment a man suspected of stabbing four children at a French playground is taken down, shot by police. Here he is, knife in hand, being chased by a passerby. At around 9.45 a.m. at this tourist hotspot at the base of the French Alps, the 31-year-old is alleged to have begun stabbing adults and children at random, at least one attacked while in their stroller. According to officials, the youngest victim is just 22 months old. The oldest, three, some now with life-threatening injuries. The suspect is described by authorities as a Syrian national, and he also attacked two adults before he was stopped. He's now in the hospital in police custody. Tonight, France's president, Emmanuel Macron, calling it an attack of absolute cowardice, saying some victims are between life and death. James Longman joins us now. James, any word on a motive? No, Lindsay, the motive remains unknown, although it's not thought to be terror-related. This is a man who was known to be homeless. He'd been seen washing in the lake by police, but other than that, hadn't had any run-ins with them. He had had uh, an asylum application granted to him in Sweden uh, 10 years ago. Now, those children, the four children, they remain in a very serious condition in the hospital. The prosecutor said today their condition was extremely fragile. But I do want to leave you with a little bit of hope. Uh, we understand the mayor says that when this attack took place, Place, six high school students who were nearby decided to link arms around the children to try to shield them. A bit of light in the darkness. Lindsay? We appreciate that silver lining there. James Longman, our thanks to you. Euron van der Sloot has arrived in the U.S. after his extradition from Peru. He's the prime suspect in the disappearance of Alabama teenager Natalie Holloway 18 years ago. Now here to face charges that he extorted Holloway's mother for a quarter of a million dollars. ABC's Elwin Lopez reports from Birmingham, Alabama. Nearly two decades ago, Natalie Holloway vanished on her high school graduation trip in Aruba. And tonight, the main suspect in the Alabama teen's disappearance, Euron van der Sloot, is on American soil behind bars in Birmingham. He is facing extortion and wire fraud charges for allegedly demanding a quarter of a million dollars from Holloway's mother. That sum reportedly in exchange for information leading to the teen's body. This morning, Vandersloat handed over to the FBI by authorities in Peru. Back in 2005, authorities say Holloway was last seen driving off with three young men, including 17-year-old Vandersloat. He was never charged and has maintained his innocence over the years. Tonight, her mother Beth stating in part, I am overcome with mixed emotions, adding that today she is hopeful that some small semblance of justice may finally be realized. She's certainly been waiting a long time for that. Ellen Lopez joins us now. Ellen, what happens next in this case? Yeah, Lindsay, Vandersloot will be arraigned here tomorrow at this courthouse behind me. He will not be here in the United States for long. He still has to finish his sentence in Peru. But, Lindsay, if he's convicted here, he would have to return to the U.S. in 15 years. Lindsay. Elwin Lopez, our thanks to you. To the Florida neighbor accused of shooting and killing a mother of four through her front door, now appearing before a judge, the suspect has been charged with manslaughter and assault and ordered to remain behind bars with the sheriff's department now listing her as a suicide risk. Here's ABC's Victor Akendo. Tonight, the woman accused of killing her neighbor, shooting the mother of four right through her front door in front of her children, appearing before a Florida judge. Good morning, ma'am. What is your name? Susan Lorenz. Susan Lorenz, seen in a green suicide prevention vest in the Marion County Jail, 
listed as a suicide risk, according to the sheriff's department. Police say on Friday, Lorenz confronted 35-year-old Ajika A.J. Owens' children for playing in this field near her residence. Lorenz allegedly throwing an iPad and skates at the children when Owens knocked at Lorenz's apartment. Her 10-year-old son standing by her side. Police say the neighbor fired a single shot through the locked front door, striking her in the chest. For days, Owens' family called for Lorenz's arrest. Florida has a stand-your-ground law that permits the use of deadly force if there is a presumption of fear. The sheriff saying the law does not apply in this case. Lorenz charged with manslaughter. This situation is a prime example of when it was not justified. It was simply a killing. Neighbors say this isn't the first time she's argued with children. She's got history. She was the one who started everything in the first place. And Lorenz will be held behind bars pending a bond hearing. If convicted, she could face up to 30 years in prison. Lindsay? Victor, thank you. Christian evangelist and former presidential candidate Pat Robertson passed away early this morning, best known for his political commentary on the 700 Club and as the founder of the Christian Broadcasting Network. Robertson started the network back in 1960, eventually growing to become incredibly influential in Christian conservative circles. Known for his contributions in turning the religious right into a powerful political force, he also drew outrage with many of his claims, including when he agreed with Jerry Falwell that abortionists and gay people were to blame for 9-11. Pat Robertson Robertson was 93 years old. So much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, what millions could be facing in the months ahead as student loan repayments are on the cusp of coming due. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. We are honored, ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I'm Devin Dwyer reporting from Burlington, Vermont. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Millions of Americans have gotten a big break from paying back their student loans during the pandemic emergency, but that's about to end soon. So what could it all mean? We take a look by the numbers. Some 43 million people, that's one in six adult Americans, have federal student loan debt, totaling more than $1.6 trillion. But borrowers have not been required to pay back those loans since March of 2020, when legislative and executive action put payments on pause at the start of the pandemic. There have been nine extensions of the pause over three years by the Trump and Biden administrations, allowing borrowers to continue getting a break from restarting those payments. But the recent debt ceiling deal cemented a plan to restart student loan payments 60 days after June 30th, which means at the end of August, those bills will once again come due. Meanwhile, borrowers are waiting to see whether Biden's loan forgiveness plan, which would eliminate $10,000 for most borrowers and up to $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients, will be shot down by the Supreme Court this month as un 
unconstitutional. Some 26 million borrowers applied for the cancellation program, according to the White House. Once repayments do resume, experts warn that delinquency rates could return to the previous high of 10% or more, as many Americans have adjusted their monthly budgets, not factoring in those loan payments. And with a new monthly student loan bill averaging $160, resuming loan payments may also cause a hit to the economy, as Americans have, have to cut back on personal spending to cover their loan debts. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The sounds and rhythms that captured an island and the world have a new generation of artists that are making it all their own. And you know him from shows like Monk, Wings, and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. The extraordinary Tony Chaloub joins us in studio to discuss his latest film, Flame and Hot. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. An arrest in the case of a missing mother of two. A grandmother is scammed using artificial intelligence and another streaming service could soon have ads. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Police confirmed they found the body of a missing mother in Winona, Minnesota. Authorities discovered the human remains of Madeline Kingsbury along Highway 43 yesterday afternoon. Hours later, police arresting Adam Fravel, her ex-boyfriend and father of her two children. She was last seen with him, dropping off their children at daycare on March 31st. He has denied having anything to do with her disappearance. California's governor is proposing a 28th amendment to the U.S. Constitution addressing gun violence. Governor Gavin Newsom argues his plan for a 28th amendment would take a stand against gun violence and a lack of action by Congress. It would raise the minimum age to buy a gun to 21 nationwide, implement universal background checks, establish a waiting period to buy a gun, and prevent civilian access to what the governor calls assault weapons. Two-thirds of states would have to call for the proposal in order for it to be considered. It's an idea that will be a non-starter in many Republican-run states. 
You're watching a California grandmother hand over thousands of dollars after falling victim to a scam. 89-year-old Shirley got a call last week and saw her grandson's name on the caller ID. She picked up and heard a voice that she says sounded exactly like him, saying that he'd been in an accident. And he said, Grandma, I broke my nose. The person on the line handed the phone to a person Shirley was told was her grandson's attorney, who told her her grandson had been arrested for hitting another car and injuring a pregnant woman. Was, of course, sh very shook up. That person telling Shirley if she paid more than $9,000 in cash, the charges would be dropped. Shirley went to the bank and got the cash and is seen on this video handing it over. Moments later, she received another call saying the pregnant woman's baby had died and that the charges were now more serious. I was hysterical almost. Uh, I cried. This lady had lost a baby and that my grandson was going to be charged with murder. The person on the line demanding an additional $5,000, which she also handed over. Shirley not realizing she was being fooled until she finally called her grandson. Having fun is not worth the cost of life. Trini Alaparthi and his family were out on the Florida Keys last summer enjoying a parasailing excursion they'd found online when the weather quickly deteriorated and their adventure took a tragic turn. The parasail caught in wind gusts of up to 30 miles per hour, pulling the boat off course. When the boat's crew could not reel in the parasail, the captain made the decision to cut it loose. The three passengers plummeting, the parasail dragging them for miles before hitting a bridge. Srini's wife, Sapraja, was killed, their 10-year-old son and 7-year-old nephew badly injured. In September, the boat's captain, Daniel Couch, was charged with manslaughter and multiple boating violations. He's pleaded not guilty. Alaparthi has filed a lawsuit against him, his colleague, the boat company, and the marina. Actress Shannon Doherty revealing the breast cancer she was first diagnosed with in 2015 has now spread to her brain. In an emotional message posted on Instagram, the 90210 and Charm Star taking fans behind the scenes of radiation treatment, which initially took place in January, writing, the first round of radiation took place. My fear is obvious. I am extremely claustrophobic, and there is a lot going on in my life. Famous friends and former colleagues responding with their support. Actress Sarah Michelle Gellar writing, you are a warrior. Selma Blair, who has faced her own health struggles with MS writing, I am wishing for all the wise peace you have learned to find you in the terror moments, to know we are holding you. Amazon is reportedly ready to introduce ads to its Prime video service, reportedly looking to generate more revenue from entertainment. It's unclear how much an ad-supported plan would cost or if it would affect Amazon Prime members. Known for his performances in Monk, Wings, and The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Tony Shalhoub is now starring in a new film called Flame and Hot about the man, the myth, the legend, Richard Montañez, who channeled his upbringing and says that he turned the iconic Flame and Hot Cheeto snack into a global phenomenon. Let's take a look. We all write our own stories. Where is Richard? I'd like to speak to him. I'm here. This is mine. That's me, the Mero Mero, Mr. Richard Montañez. I'm the guy who helped bring the world the most popular snack it's ever seen. Are you ready? I will. I've been ready. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having this, me. This looks like a fun one. Okay, so you play Roger, who challenges Richard's ideas here. What attracted you to this role? Oh, well, um, you know, it's it's really kind of a um, you know a guy who starts out uh, from very modest beginnings, makes good very persistent. Um, it's a sort of an immigrant story. You know, this is a, th this character of Richard Montañez is a Mexican from a, a Mexican community in California. And my character, uh, Roger Enrico, who was really the head of PepsiCo who, that owned Frito-Lay, he too actually came from modest beginnings, was from a small town in Minnesota. Um, and you know, became this very, very powerful figure in the corporate world. And he took, he took um, Richard Montaigne's ideas and supported him and, and, and turned it into this huge success. So, I don't know, there's something about that whole kind of, um, you know, 
you know, uh, up from the bootstraps, right. makes good American dream story that appealed to me. Very entertaining script, very inspiring and very funny. And, and directed by Eva Longoria. What was that like to work with her? Amazing. Her first movie, her, her first, her directorial debut. Right. And, uh, you know, I came into the project, I, I think my sh filming was in the last week. And um, it was a well-oiled machine. The crew, the cast were devoted to her and would have done anything for her. And um, I, I just found her just so on top of, on top of the situation, really, really uh, prepared with a real vision, but also giving us freedom to kind of, you know, to play and to discover as we were filming. Now, had you ever had a Flaming Hot Cheeto before the movie? Oh, absolutely. And you, you're a fan. I, I love spicy foods in general, <laughs> and um, and I do like Flaming Hot Cheetos. But um, it was fun. Uh, play, my character uh, plays this guy who he gets sent samples of it and gets to taste it, you know, for the first time. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was sort of interesting having a kind of game-changing experience uh, for, for this character. If, By the way, I just want to, for the record, not my real hair. Okay? Oh, Is that okay. Obvious, All or right. I think I, that's fairly I real. thought it looked like a wig. It was the I, hair that I know. really, <laughs> I always dreamed of having, <laughs> but never I did love get. your curls, actually. Well, thank you. Uh, so let's go to your character, Abe, from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Are you surprised how it concluded for him? Well, well not really. I mean, I'm... The writers always surprised us and never disappointed us, but Abe's whole arc over the five seasons was uh, it was incredible. You know, from where he started as a as a as a father, as a professional, um, uh, you know, a, a math professor at Columbia, to where he ended up uh, in his relationship with his wife, in his relationship with his children. Um, it, you know, as a man moving from out of the fifties into the sixties in that whole cultural shift. I, uh, I, it was a very satisfying ending for, for all the characters, but for me especially, working on Abe. Real hair on that one. Absolutely real hair <laughs> and real mustache most of the time. Last time you were here, uh, you talked about yeah, how people were discussing maybe a reboot of Monk. Any update for fans? We just wrapped, actually, we did a, a one-off, a film for streaming for Peacock. Okay. Um, we uh, just filmed, um, finished filming and it's uh you know going to be a 90 minute 100 minute film and it's revisiting this character after 14 years because that's how long it's been since we wow. wrapped the series but um uh it's revisiting this character you know with covid in the mix and uh how that impacted him and the world around him now sag after just voted uh to authorize a strike if negotiations don't go their way can right. you share with us how you voted there i Absolutely supported, uh, yeah, the the um, the ratification. I I just, you know, the the WGA is out now. Mm -hmm. The DGA is coming up. I think yeah. they're in they're in negotiations as we speak, and SAG after is coming up soon. So um, you know, it doesn't mean we're going to strike, of course, but it does give our fearless leaders, um, you know, uh, a little more clout as they're going into these talks. So we're keeping our fingers crossed and hope everybody does the right thing. We are all keeping our fingers crossed. We thank you so much for coming by. Really thank appreciate you. having you. We want our viewers to know that you can watch Flamin' Hot on Hulu and Disney Plus on June 9th. It's a genre steeped in cultural history. Reggae represents peace, spirituality, and love. And now the decades-old sound is evolving in a fresh generation of singers who are elevating the beloved music to new heights. Armona Kosarabdi sat down with the stars of the new school of reggae and dancehall to talk about launching reggae and dancehall into the respect they deserve. Born in the vibrant island of Jamaica is a genre that captivates the soul with its rhythm and profound messages thanks to iconic artists like Bob Marley, a sound that transcends borders, spreading its vibes worldwide with songs like Get Up, Stand Up. Serving as a powerful voice for change, advocating for love, peace, and equality, inspiring other talented musicians to follow the path, creating what's being called a new school. <laughs> Meet the queen of dance hall, Spice. winding her ways to the infectious beats bound to the sound she helped create and shape. 
Born Grace Hamilton, the proud Jamaican artist, grew up on the music of reggae and dancehall icons. My father, he was a raster. He used to play like a lot of Bob Marley songs, a lot of Professor Nut songs. That's where I discovered music. And I used to sing them. I used to love the way I was sound. And he's like, you're going to be a star. Sing for me, my daughter. The influence of reggae began in the late 1960s and was first introduced by the band Toots and the Matals by their hit single, Do the Reggae. Artists like Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler propelled reggae further. The music is rooted in Rastafarianism, an Afrocentric religion that advocated for Pan-Africanist ideologies. Black History Month and Reggae Month are both in February. We usually celebrate them during that month because the Emancipator Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, you know, their birthdays were during that month. And Bob Marley's birthday was during that month, which is why Reggae Month was established. Black History Month and Reggae Month being the same month now is no coincidence. I think that this is the music for black people, this is the music for oppressed people, and this is the music of unity. Not only is reggae a form of protest music contesting against the British colonialism that has operated on the island for centuries, it also emphasizes spirituality, a theme crooned by this generation's reggae singers like Chronics, Coffee, and Leela Ike. Brown girl from the ghetto, hear my retro. Grounded by faith, Leela Ike's stage name comes from Nigeria, Ike Chukwu, meaning power of God. I really started to connect with reggae music on like a deeper level when I started reading about, you know, Rastafari and the history of it. It was like the first piece of music that felt like me, you know, being a black Jamaican girl and, you know, reggae music being birthed out of this country and our whole heritage and everything. So I think this new age of, of reggae is just us boring influences with, with a really great and beautiful foundation that was set by, you know, our forefathers in music. To be taken for Reggae's laid back and more relaxed sound differs from the bouncy rhythms of dancehall. Dancehall was birthed from reggae music. It's just a faster paced rhythm, a more high tempo, more aggressive sound, and a reggae music is more soothing, more cultural. It's a very bold, expressive kind of music. Dancehall, you can identify dancehall separate from reggae by our language, the patois. <laughs> We speak about dancing a lot, gyrating the waistline a lot, because it's a high tempo, high energy, sound box, bass line kind of vibe. One of the DJs contributing to this vibrant vibe is King of Dance Hall, Beanie Man, who has been a household name for decades. Bob Marley inspired all of us as Jamaica. His music was before his time. That's why they still here. Every man will listen to a Bob Marley song, and it's still it. He's one of the greatest inspirations we ever had. He inspired us to sing songs that is going to last forever. Winning his first Grammy for Best Reggae Album in 2001, he says international stardom is now so much easier to achieve. It's very easy because of technology. Technology rise. A guy can sing in his bathroom and become the biggest artist in the world. It's not easy to access. Many critics of dance hall, however, say the music is hypersexualized and misogynistic. What would you say to someone who's like, this is too sexualized? I would say to them that this is our culture. You know, every place in this world has their own culture that they represent. Dance hall also brings people to Jamaica. It's fun for us. That's our livelihood. We express ourselves differently as a Jamaican. This is a space where they are completely liberated in their sensuality and sexuality, and it's not hypersexualized. It's not odd at all. So as much as it's male-dominated because there just might be more men, women are so profound in this genre that it will never be a genre without women. The influence of dancehall and reggae on other genres is profound. The sound and language of Jamaica can be found in reggaeton, hip-hop, pop, and also Afrobeats. Jamaica's music is not as recognized by many mainstream music award shows. The Grammys, for example, only recognizes reggae, but not dancehall. Reggae and dancehall is two different genres. It's two different vibes. It's two di different representation. And so I do feel like we definitely need a category for dancehall separately from reggae. So many people take away from our culture and they don't want to give credit to it. But Jamaican culture, we do inspire a lot of other genres. 
Spice was nominated for a Grammy in 2021 for Best Reggae Album for her debut Reggae Album 10. As the first hardcore dancehall female artist to ever be nominated, a career-defining moment. But she believes more recognition of the genre is necessary. As the queen of the dancehall, I do need support from like other people in the genre. So they have no choice but to open spots for our genre. It's not fair for it to be overlooked. As reggae and dancehall continues to make waves globally, artists of different backgrounds want a piece of what Jamaica's music has to offer. Black culture is popular culture. And so definitely it's penetrated the top 100 more times than we can speak, whether it was credited or not, whether it was from the beat or the soul or the slang or the sayings that different artists like Drake or Rihanna or Ed Sheeran use um, or Justin Bieber. It's there. It's always been there and it's always going to be there. For Spice, as she tours around the world, she'll always carry the sound and culture of Jamaica with her. How do you have such powerful impact from a tiny island? Prior and work conquers all. What I'm living now is what I've prayed for, what I've worked for, what I've invested. We need to hold these outlets accountable for acknowledging dancehall, which is a genre that is so impactful to other genres. I feel like consistency is really what brought me here. And not just hard work, but smart work. Our thanks to Mona for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Next hour, we'll bring you the very latest reporting on former President Donald Trump and the special counsel's investigation into his handling of classified documents and what the latest Supreme Court decision means for millions of voters across the country. It's all coming up. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Taiwan, I'm Rick Clennett. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, breaking news as we come on the air in the West involving former President Trump acknowledging himself tonight that he has been indicted on federal charges. The first time in history a former president has been charged at the federal level. Tonight, what are the charges? What we know so far here. The former president told to appear in federal court in Miami next Tuesday to face the charges. Tonight, our team talking with sources at Bedminster in New Jersey, where the former president is huddled with his advisors. He had recently been told by the special counsel that he was the target of a criminal investigation into his handling 
handling of classified documents. That was a signal that this could be coming. And tonight, it is now playing out. A former president indicted by the special counsel. Pierre Thomas, Dan Abrams, and our investigative team and what they've learned at this hour and what America will now witness play out next week. Also tonight, 120 million Americans now under alerts and warnings over hazardous smoke now stretching down through the Northeast all the way down to Washington, D.C., Alabama. Hundreds of wildfires in Canada, more than half still out of control. The New York City skyline blanketed. In the nation's capital, the Washington Monument barely visible. After New York City reported the worst air quality in the world, another American city tonight recording a level even worse. Some schools in the Northeast closed. President Biden already sending hundreds of firefighters to help Canada. Trevor Alt reporting and Rob Marciano timing this out. Tonight, the prime suspect in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway has now been extradited from Peru to the U.S. Joran Vandersloot arriving late today and where this goes from here. In Florida, the case of the young mother shot and killed by her neighbor. That neighbor shooting right through her own front door. Tonight, that suspect appearing for the judge, listed as a suicide risk, forced to wear a green vest, now charged with manslaughter. A major civil rights victory at the Supreme Court. Two conservative justices siding with the liberals today, upholding the Voting Rights Act, striking down Alabama's congressional map because it hurts black voters. Here in the U.S., one of America's most controversial TV evangelists has died. Pat Robertson, who hosted the 700 Club, who once ran for president, and who agreed with Jerry Falwell, who blamed gay people and others for 9-11. The well-known actress and her deeply personal video, her breast cancer battle and the turn. Shannon Doherty's very brave message tonight. And America Strong this evening, the astounding $100 million donation to veterans in need, supporting so many groups, including Bob Woodruff's. A remarkable gift you have to see right here. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening as we come on the air live in the West tonight. And we do begin at this hour with the breaking news. Former President Donald Trump has been indicted by a federal grand jury in connection with his handling of classified documents after he left the White House. The former president acknowledging the news himself on social media, saying he and his lawyers have been informed that the former president has been indicted. Donald Trump has been told to be in Florida on Tuesday to appear in federal court at 3 p.m. It is a historic development the first time a former president has been indicted on federal criminal charges. Our investigative team reporting the former president will face at least seven charges. We are told the range of those charges includes obstruction, willful retention of documents related to our national security, false statements, conspiracy. Again, our investigative team learning that's the range of charges, the exact charges we are still waiting to hear from the special counsel. Our team standing by here tonight, and we start with the history made this evening, the weight, the significance of these charges, and what this could mean in the race for president. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas leading us off. Tonight, a federal grand jury has voted to indict Donald Trump in the special counsel's investigation into his handling of classified documents. Prosecutors telling the former president he will be arraigned in Miami on Tuesday. And sources telling ABC News Trump is facing multiple counts ranging from illegal retention of government documents to conspiracy to obstruction of the government's efforts to retrieve those documents. The indictment marks the first time an American president has faced federal charges. Tonight, Trump reacting on his social media site saying he never thought it possible that such a thing could happen, calling it a dark day. The former president insisting all along he's done nothing wrong. All I know is this, everything I did was right. We have the Presidential Records Act, which I abided by 100%. After leaving the White House, Trump spent months haggling with the National Archives over whether he had in fact returned all government records as required by law. The Justice Department then obtaining a court-ordered subpoena. But when the FBI learned Trump still had sensitive records, despite his team's insistence that they had turned everything over, agents raided his home at Mar-a-Lago, seizing more than 100 classified documents. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. Trump has argued that he declassified any material that he took from the White House. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it. Right, but Trump's attorneys have offered no specific evidence in court 
that records were declassified, and prosecutors clearly believe they have evidence that proves otherwise, including Donald Trump on tape allegedly admitting he held on to sensitive material. And so let's get right to Pierre Thomas live in our Washington bureau tonight. And Pierre, you and I were on the air together when this broke earlier this evening. There were questions in the legal world about whether there would be what's called a, a speaking indictment from the special counsel, Jack Smith, essentially uh, laying out in great detail, in narrative form, what he discovered, why he believes, the special counsel believes that this evidence warrants these uh, very serious charges uh, to try to explain this to the American people. And you've learned tonight that that's exactly what the special counsel plans to do. David, I've been told to expect a speaking indictment that will lay out chapter and verse the government's case. The special counsel knows the American public will need transparency given the historic nature of these charges and the fact that we have such a divided nation. David? Pierre Thomas leading us off on, on what is history in the making here. Pierre, thank you. I want to get right to ABC News investigative reporter Catherine Falders, uh, who was first with the range of charges when we came on the air earlier tonight. Catherine, you reported at least seven charges. And again, give us the range here of what the former president is going to face here. Yeah, that's right, David. I'm told these charges include the willful retention of national defense information, conspiracy to obstruct justice, concealing a document in a federal investigation, and false statements. But key here, that key charge, is the willful retention of national defense information. That's under the Espionage Act. That's what the government uses to go after individuals they believe have caused harm to America's national security. David? And again, the people at home are watching the range there on their screen right there, and we await a word on what the exact counts will be uh, in the hours and days ahead. Catherine, thank you for that reporting tonight. I want to bring in ABC's John Santucci, also on the investigative team here. John, you covered the Trump administration. You've also been in touch with sources uh, close to Donald Trump tonight with him at Bedminster in New Jersey. Uh, when they learned the news? They have been huddled for the last couple hours, David. They knew this was coming. I am told the former president is determined, ready to head to Florida to face those charges. And David, even though Donald Trump has written on social media he never thought this was possible, I am told, David, the former president and his advisors were waiting anxiously. They believed any minute this was coming. John Santucci, our thanks to you as well. I want to begin our chief legal analyst, Dan Abrams, tonight. Dan, two questions for our viewers at home, because we haven't heard uh, from Jack Smith yet at all here really very few leaks from the special counsel but given the range of charges we just heard there from Catherine and of course we're being very careful here because we don't have the exact counts but the range here what does it say about what Jack Smith believes he has uncovered uh, because of course he knows the stakes too. the history made here in charging a former president yeah it, it means that not only does he believe that the former president retained classified documents illegally not only does he believe that the former president obstructed in the efforts to get them back but that the documents themselves were very sensitive. They were important. That's where the willful retention of the national defense information charge becomes so significant because it tells us that. And Dan, the venue here, uh, is there any relief in Bedminster tonight, any relief for Donald Trump that this would appear that it will be playing out in a federal court in Florida? Certainly better for him in Florida. Better possible judges, better possible jurors, no question, if he's given a choice, he'd much rather have it in Florida than in Washington, D.C. All right, Dan Abrams, our chief legal analyst with us here tonight. Dan, thank you. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is in Florida tonight. He's in Miami, where this will play out next Tuesday with the country watching. And Aaron, you reported here in New York when we, when we saw the indictment play out in Manhattan in the hush money case. Uh, but you don't need me to tell you this is very different. These are federal criminal charges. The stakes are far higher. And, and what will the viewers, what will the country witness early next week when the former president reports to federal court in Florida? David, when former President Trump arrives here at U.S. District Court, downtown Miami, Tuesday afternoon, he will be placed under arrest by the very government that he was once elected to lead. Then he will be booked and processed like any other federal defendant. He'll have to appear before a federal magistrate to enter a plea to the charges based on how he's reacted on social media tonight. We expect that would be a not guilty plea. The courthouse here is stepping up security, taking no chances, David. Stepping up security already tonight. Aaron Katursky in Florida, where we will see the president next Tuesday reporting to federal court. Aaron, thank you. One more beat on this tonight. ABC's Rachel Scott is in Iowa. She's covering the race for president already. Uh, just this week, Rachel, you have former Vice President Mike Pence jumping in, running, saying that his former boss, Donald Trump, should never be president again. But he also said he believes that the president should not be indicted. And then you have Chris Christie 
sort of at the other end of the Republican spectrum here so far in this primary, jumping in this week, signaling he's ready to take on Trump by name. Uh, obviously a former federal prosecutor in Chris Christie, but even he tonight is saying, I want to see these charges first. Yes, and as a former federal prosecutor, Chris Christie knows how high the stakes are. I just spoke with him moments ago. He wants to read the details of this indictment, but he says that if Trump did commit a crime, then he should be charged. Other candidates walking a very fine line. A few hours ago, I pressed Vice President Mike Pence on this. He told me while he does believe there needs to be new leadership in the Republican Party, he believes that an indictment would further divide the country. There are 12 Republican candidates in the race right now, and only one, former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson is calling on Trump to step aside because of these criminal investigations, David. All eyes on the Republican candidates in this race as well tonight. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Thanks to Rachel, Dan Abrams, John Santucci, Catherine Falders, Pierre Thomas, who let us off, and of course the entire team on with us for our special report. Thank you for reporting it out so carefully tonight. In the meantime, we're going to move on to the other news this Thursday evening into this record haze and smoke from Canadian wildfires spreading tonight. More than 120 million Americans now across 20 states at risk. The system still locked in place at this hour in the stunning images. New York City recorded its worst air in decades in the last 24 hours. And tonight, take a look at this. Orange, the orange sky from the hazardous air has now reached Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument right there, shrouded in the haze. Tonight, the toxic air triggering an air quality emergency. These images right here from Philadelphia. This evening, the smoke causing more air travel disruptions, ground stops for a time at a number of major airports, including LaGuardia Airport. Philadelphia had a ground stop, Washington, D.C. as well. And here's the map again tonight. The wildfire smoke forecast this evening still pouring in that Omega block Rob Marciano told us about last night here. That's still in place. So how long before it shifts? Rob is standing by to show us. But first, Trevor Rolp on the stunning images and the fires in Canada. Hundreds of them, at least half, still burning out of control tonight. Tonight, that monster plume of wildfire smoke spreading deeper into the U.S. After New York City registered what's likely its worst air quality of all time Wednesday, cities to the south and west from New Jersey and Pennsylvania to D.C. and beyond enveloped in that toxic haze. Overnight, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania hitting 491 on the air quality index's 1 to 500 scale, even worse than New York City's 484 on Wednesday. In Washington, D.C., the city's first code purple air quality advisory, signifying very unhealthy air. The White House forced to postpone a pride event on the South Lawn that some 2,000 people were set to attend. Health officials warning continued exposure to the particulates in the air is especially harmful to young children. And the source of the smoke, those wildfires burning in Canada, hundreds of them still out of control in multiple parts of the country. The U.S. has sent assets and more than 600 firefighters to Canada so far. And David, New York's governor says they'll be sending forest rangers to Canada, joining firefighters from other border states like New Hampshire and Maine. And while New York City's air quality has clearly improved, it is still registering in the top five worst major cities in the entire world. David. And that's just incredible. Trevor, thank you. Let's get right to see the meteorologist Rob Marciano, who is timing this out for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, David. I don't see widespread relief for several more days. As for yesterday, the results are in. When you talk about population density, it was the worst air quality our nation has had as a whole since 2006. Let's get to those colorful maps we've grown so used to this week and track where all that dangerous air is. Buffalo to Pittsburgh, getting again into D.C. and Philadelphia and South Jersey in the morning. Virginia, you too, North Carolina. Look at that. It goes as far west as Louisville and Columbus by tomorrow night. But the system, the pattern does break down somewhat over the weekend. And this week, cool front will press to the east round about Monday that'll shift our winds and hopefully bring some rain much needed rain to the fires up there in Canada by Monday night or into Tuesday but that's several days away. David. All right, Rob Marciano, our thanks to you again tonight as well. In Florida, the woman accused of killing her neighbor, shooting a mother of four right through her front door in front of her children, appearing before a Florida judge. Susan Lawrence, seen in a green suicide prevention vest. She's listed as a suicide risk. That's why there's a vest by the Sheriff's Department, that labeling. She's now charged with manslaughter tonight. 
In the meantime, we turn now to the Supreme Court at a major ruling upholding the Voting Rights Act. Two conservative justices, Chief Justice John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh, joining the court's liberal justices in striking down Alabama's congressional map, which critics say diluted the power of black voters. That map drawn by the Republican-led state legislature they decided violated the Voting Rights Act. Tonight, the lead suspect in the Natalie Holloway disappearance, Joran Vandersloot, has been extradited to the U.S. now. He arrived late today from Peru. Natalie Holloway vanished on her high school graduation trip in Aruba in 2005. Vandersloot is here to face extortion charges for allegedly demanding a quarter of a million dollars from Holloway's mother. When we come back here tonight, one of America's most controversial TV evangelists has died. What he once agreed with when it came to 9-11 in a moment. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, one of America's most controversial TV evangelists has died. Pat Robertson, the longtime host of the 700 Club. He once ran for president. He had millions of followers, and he drew outrage with many of his claims. He agreed with Jerry Falwell when Falwell blamed abortionists and gay people for 9-11. Robertson telling Falwell at the time, I totally concur. Pat Robertson was 93. When we come back here tonight, the well-known actress, her breast cancer battle spreading, and her very brave message tonight. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. Oh, wait, there is. Bring your friends. Good morning, America. GMA 7A. Now that's how you start your day. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To the index and actress Shannon Doherty revealing very personal news about her cancer battle. First diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015, she says the cancer has now spread to her brain. She did post an emotional message on Instagram showing her undergoing radiation treatment in January. She writes of her fear and she said this is what cancer can look like. So many in that fight with her. Tonight, friends and former co-stars posting their support. When we come back here, the astounding gift tonight to veterans in need. This evening, helping Bob Woodruff's group too. Standing up for heroes in a really big way tonight. In a moment here. Make any sense? Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target, and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Generation Gap. June 29th. What is Secretariat? A secretary? That's a woman? The comedy game show where nobody acts their age is back. Juniors and seniors work together to flex their pop culture knowledge for big prizes and bigger fun. Who is this Mr.? Mr. Rockstar? Mr. T is going to be very upset with all of us. <laughs> Generation Gap. Season premiere June 29th on ABC and stream on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
right now in America with so much at stake. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. Oh, wait, there is. Bring your friends. Good morning, America. GMA 7A. Now that's how you start Bring your day. Friends. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Finally tonight here, America Strong, the remarkable gift, the $100 million donation to veterans in need, supporting so many groups, including our own Bob Woodruff, who stands up for heroes, and we stand with him. Here's Martha Raddatz. It is the astounding gift to U.S. veterans in need. You volunteered here too, right? right? I was right over there. We are with Craig Newmark, founder of Craigslist, as he begins to give away $100 million to our American veterans. Craig, what you're doing and the money you're donating is a remarkable amount. Uh, thanks. My whole philanthropy deal is basically that I should help and defend and protect the people who defend and protect our country. The money already starting to help through nonprofits like Blue Star Families, their reading, food, and outreach programs, and the Bob Woodruff Foundation, of course, from our colleague and friend Bob Woodruff, severely injured by a roadside bomb in 2006 while reporting in Iraq. His medical team, his family, helping him recover. Oh, so great to be home. <laughs> For 17 years now. How are you, bro? Look at you. Bob, paying it forward. The Bob Woodruff people are good at uh, helping out uh, veterans, the veterans' families, and they help fund organizations who are on the ground getting stuff done. Organizations like God's Love We Deliver here in New York City, delivering more than 3.5 million meals this year alone. Thanks to God's love, I got some food in the freezer. Navy veteran Rob Bergman. God's love comes and helps me out with some help when I need it once in a while. I don't know what I do without it. The need is great, but so is the generosity and impact. When you look at the lives that you truly have changed, it's got to feel pretty good. Uh, as a nerd, I'm uncomfortable with getting credit. But sometimes going public in a big way amplifies what we're doing. So I'm happy to tolerate it. Well, we salute Craig Newmark giving 100 million to veterans in need. Incredible. And thank you, Martha. Good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Buckingham Palace, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We, of course, are following breaking news at this hour involving former President Trump. If you're just joining us, here's what we know right now. Sources tell ABC News former President Trump has been indicted on at least seven federal counts. ABC News has confirmed that Donald Trump and his lawyers have just been informed that the former president needs to be in federal court in Miami on Tuesday at 3 p.m. to process on federal charges. This, of course, would be the first former president ever to be indicted on federal charges. This investigation has been ongoing now for more than a year. Special counsel Jack Smith's office has been gathering evidence since November on two fronts, classified documents and on the events leading up to and including January 6th. Less than 24 hours ago, we learned that the former president had recently received a letter from the special counsel's office officially informing him that he was the target of an ongoing investigation. That, of course, signaled that this could be coming. And on Tuesday, we will see what will amount to it, an unprecedented scene. Trump will be placed under arrest by the government who he was formerly elected to lead. Our team is reporting the story out for us tonight. I want to start out with our ABC News contributor and former GOP Congressman John Katko of New York. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. First, let me just get your reaction to this news. A, a grand jury voting to indict the former president now for a second time. It's really a historical event that has transpired here, and the charges are quite serious. Anyone who's ever dealt with classified documents like I have for over 30 years will tell you, when you mishandle classified documents, really bad things can happen. So the penalties in the law are very, very strict in that regard. And so this is a very serious development and something that should be taken very seriously by the, by the, by the former president. A former Trump, uh, former President Trump has insisted all along that, that he's done nothing wrong. Uh, but these do seem to be very serious charges over his handling of classified documents. As a former congressman, what's your view on the issue of his handling of classified documents after he left the White House? Well, I can tell you, I, I handled them for 20 years as a, a organized crime prosecutor before going to Congress and then as head of the Homeland Security in Congress. I can tell you classified documents are very serious matters. They're handled in a very serious manner in secure settings and are never to leave those secure settings. So this is um, the, his handling of those documents on its face. I can tell you from a prosecutor's point of view, um, the fact that they found so many documents at his home and, and the way in which they found them clearly outside a, a classified setting in and of itself makes the case extremely strong against the president. The former president. So, to me, this is uh, this. He, he has a very uh, big hill to climb to overcome these charges because I'm not sure what his defense can be to that. Politically, what kind of impact do you think that this case will have on the former president as he makes yet another bid for the White House? Yeah, I mean that, that's the question here, right? Uh, his base is his base. He'll 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 take on the martyr complex and he'll take on the uh, the feeling that you know they're out to get me. But, you know, your base is your base, but uh, when they're starting to be presented with all this information and all this, this conduct, whether they agree with the, the methods of the, uh, of the charges or not, sooner or later they start making a, a value decision. And so uh, this absolutely will not help him going forward. The question is whether it's going to hurt him. Uh, with, his, with his hardcore base, probably not. Those on the fringes of his base, it may impact that, and it, it could be a very serious impact for him in, in a negative way. How do you expect your fellow Republicans still in Congress to react to this? And, and I kind of, by extension, want to ask about, you know, for example, we heard from Tim Scott today, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence. And Mike Pence offered that, you know, I would hope that the Department of Justice does not move forward, not because I know the facts, but simply because I think after years where we've seen a pol politicization of the Justice Department is to undermine confidence and equal treatment of the law. We heard uh, from several people who are running against him now uh, for president, several Republicans who were talking about how they felt that this was divisive and political and they didn't want to see these uh, charges come forward. Well, nobody wants to see a former president charged with a crime, but but the, the reality is he has been. So now you got to start dealing with the reality of it, right? And uh, I think a lot of people in the Republican Party are loath to uh, um, break ways with, with uh, former President Trump and uh, because of his power with the base of the party, which is all important in that primary season. But, um, you know, we, we have to see how this all unfolds and have to see when the evidence comes out. If this is, in fact, what they call a, 
speaking indictment, that meaning that there's specific facts laid out in the indictment, well then uh, I think people will get a taste for uh, the conduct that is alleged to have occurred and they'll make some decisions accordingly. So uh, there's a lot of speculation, but make no mistake about it. A lot of people are loath to um, uh, confront or go against uh, the former president because of the cherished base that he represents. Uh, but I just do want to follow up on that because you said no one wants to see a former president indicted. Do you feel that that's true, even if the person might be guilty? Well, I mean, listen, I, even if they are guilty, sure. I mean, it's a sad day for America. Uh, take a step back, really. It's a sad day for America. For the first time in our nation's off, awesome history, we have now a, a, a former president who's been charged with a crime. That's that's pretty stunning, and that's a huge development. And so, in that respect, it is a sad day for America. So, in that respect, nobody wants to see a former president charged. But if it's happened and, and, and the, the uh, facts warrant the charges, you have to let the facts play out and let the president have his former president have his day in court. Former Congressman John Katko, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. And now I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley, a professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, ABC News is reporting that sources say there appear to be at least seven counts here, ranging from the willful retention of national defense information to conspiracy to a crime to conceal documents to false statements and representations. Explain the significance of those types of charges in particular. Well, we know from the affidavit that was filed with the warrant um, giving rise to the search of Mar-a-Lago that back then in August of 2022, the FBI believed there was evidence at Mar-a-Lago of potential violations of the Espionage Act, which means that some of these documents might include national security information, uh, that they believed that he retained unlawfully classified information, that's a sep uh, information that's a separate charge, and third, obstruction of an FBI investigation, because we know 18 months went by before the FBI got to the point where they had to actually secure this search warrant. Now, uh, additionally, if it's if this reporting is true that we have uh, a conspiracy charge, that means there would be either other defendants that are included in the indictment that had a meeting of the minds with the former president to um, engage in some other crime, or they could have just been named as unindicted co-conspirators. But that suggests that there was some kind of a, a sort of a deal or an understanding that they were collectively going to try to conceal this information from the FBI. Uh, and then, you know, in connection with all of these multiple conversations at, with the FBI and the National Archives and the Trump team, it would not surprise me that there would be just some falsifying information, charges that they basically, there are people, maybe even the president or president's uh, representatives that made false statements to the FBI and under 18 U.S.C. 1001, that's against the law. It's not okay to lie to the federal government in connection with a federal investigation. Uh, this is a federal indictment coming from the special counsel, Jack Smith. How does that land differently than, say, the earlier indictment that we saw here in New York uh, with the hush money payments allegedly made to, to porn star Stormy Daniels? Well, I think the big issue really from the, a constitutional standpoint is when in the timeline did Donald Trump no longer... Uh, uh, serve as the president of the United States, because that is going to be a pivotal moment. Because after that time, when the baton officially moved to Joe Biden, he will not have any protections under Article Two of the Constitution, which gives a sitting president all kinds of goodies when it comes to the actions taken in the as as president of the United States. Presidents have immunity from all kinds of things on the theory that they need to be able to make decisions on behalf of the American public without being sued. So I think that the the, the big distinction among many is that if there are some actions that took place while he was technically still president, uh, he will have some arguments that will be what lawyers call questions of first impression. That is, we've never seen an indictment of a former president. We've never seen this kind of activity. And those are the kinds of things that could delay a trial and end up, frankly, before the United States Supreme Court to decide what, where are the boundaries of conduct and misconduct 
within the White House. And I think that's really what we all need to keep in mind here. Whatever happens in this case is essentially either green lighting or putting up some stop signs for future presidents, whether that be Donald Trump, who's the, you know, the presumptive nom nominee for the Republican Party, a Democrat, or presidents in 10, 20, 30 years for our children and grandchildren. This is a moment where the Constitution is really uh, being sharpened uh, for the American people. Kim Whaley, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And now I want to bring in our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. Aaron, you're there in Florida tonight. This is the first time, as we've been saying, a president has been indicted on a federal level. First, just want to go back again, that distinction, the, the federal indictment versus the prior indictment that we saw here in Manhattan. Just give us a, a sense of how this is kind of leveled up, so to speak. Oh, it sure is, not only in terms of consequences because of the nature uh, of the charges, but also, Lindsay, symbolically, here is the former president of the United States who's going to appear here at federal court in Miami, be placed under arrest by the very government he was once elected to lead. It is just an extraordinary moment come Tuesday afternoon when he's due here at U.S. District Court. Uh, in in Miami here in downtown Miami and and when he does appear he or one of his attorneys will have to enter a plea of not guilty we assume given the way he's been reacting to this indictment on social media and all along the former president has denied that he has done anything wrong and tried to uh, compare it to other leaders of the country who've been found in retention of classified documents but this case uniquely focused on more than 300 documents with classified markings that were found at the former president's estate in West Palm Beach after he left office. And maybe more importantly, Lindsay, his efforts to potentially obstruct the investigation that the feds were conducting, not loudly. At first, they tried to do it quietly without any fanfare before they finally went into that raid that everybody saw back in, in August, almost a year ago. And you said already that his lawyer will have to enter a plea for him uh, on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. What else can we expect to happen inside the courtroom? Well, there, there's a, a, a standard process that won't take very long, but, but he will be treated just like any other criminal defendant in the federal system. He will arrive. He will be formally placed under arrest, booked and processed as a federal defendant. And then he will be, appear before a federal magistrate for arraignment. He's charged by indictment, so he will have to enter that plea. Either he or one of his attorneys will, will enter it for him. And that begins what could be a, a, a year-plus-long prosecution. There will be a schedule potentially laid out for him to try and, and fight some of the charges, get them dismissed. But only when he appears, Lindsay, will we potentially understand the full scope of what the former president is facing. We understand there are no plans to unseal this indictment tonight. And why is this all playing out in Florida, not Washington, D.C.? And is this perhaps a, a friendlier crowd for him that it is playing out in Florida and not D.C.? It could be a friendlier crowd, especially if this goes to trial and Trump is, is tried by, uh, or the case is heard by some of his peers who may well be neighbors of his in West Palm Beach. Perhaps he thinks that's going to be a, a friendlier crowd for him. Of course, there are probably plenty of, of Democrats in this part of South Florida as well. But it also represents perhaps a vote of confidence by the special counsel who may be so confident in his case that he's willing to bring it right in the former president's backyard. Ordinarily, the Justice Department prefers to bring criminal charges in the, the venue where the alleged crimes occurred. So by bringing the indictment here in Florida, Lindsay, it appears the special counsel is convinced uh, the bulk, if not all, of the crimes occurred in South Florida at the former president's estate, where the documents were found, where they were allegedly moved around, where they may have been placed uh, in locations that were not secure in violation of, of federal uh, guidelines and laws, and, and maybe even more importantly, that effort to potentially obstruct what, what the feds were doing to try to retrieve those documents. Aaron Katursky reporting for us in Miami. Aaron, thank you. Now I want to bring in political director Rick Klein. Rick joins us now to talk about the political implications of yet another indictment for former President Donald Trump. Uh, Rick, obviously this is the second indictment, but this is a very different case. Will the GOP base still stand behind him? I was just uh, uh, 
reciting earlier what we heard from Pence earlier today, where he talked about how divisive this is for our country, how he thinks that this would send a terrible message to the wider world. Tim Scott uh, pretty much uh, giving the same kind of idea that they were against uh, these charges coming forward. Yeah, and Vivek Ramaswamy put out a statement just moments ago saying that he would pardon Donald Trump, another presidential candidate jumping into the fray on this. Uh, one of the outliers on this um, has been uh, go former Governor Asa Hutchison. He says that the RNC should even go so far as to change its own rules to clarify that you don't have to pledge to support someone who might be indicted. We also heard tonight from, from former Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey who says that these are clearly serious charges. He's looking at this and saying if the prosecutors feel like it was a case to bring, that has to be respected. But the, the point that you raise, Lindsay, is a very relevant one right now. We are already in the midst of a, a very active presidential campaign that will only heat up in the months to come as court dates and further information comes out about now two different sets of criminal charges and counting. We still are waiting on, on potential other charges out of, a, 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 out of the, the, the district attorney down in, um, down in Georgia. Uh, but we know that the information out there is already starting to weigh on Donald Trump. Whether it weighs on voters the same way becomes, becomes the larger question politically. There's been nothing that's happened so far in the way that the, the, the last round of criminal charges uh, developed that, that seemed to penetrate anything of his core base. But the argument from some Republicans is that all of this together, taken together, amounts to baggage that Republicans are going to start to recognize maybe this is not the guy they want to nominate. And of course, we can't separate the politics from all this, this indictment happening, as we were just saying, while the 2024 presidential race is happening. What kind of ripple effect will this have? We know you've been talking about how uh, there is no, there's nothing other than, you know, you have to be born in the United States in a certain age. You could become president, but you could be uh, charged, convicted and in a jail cell, really, and, and still run for president. It, it truly, Lindsay, there's nothing in the federal law, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that you can't run, even while under indictment, even if you were to be convicted, and even if you were to be imprisoned, to, to get a couple of steps ahead of ourselves here. Uh, but it is hard as a practical matter to, to mount a defense at the same time as you're mounting a campaign. There's going to be court appearances now, potentially in two different states, maybe even a third state that he would have to keep, presumably, uh, to, to keep the, the engine of justice going. Uh, and of course, the legal bills and, and the, the, the distraction around it would all be playing out at at the same time. I think what I'm going to have my eye on from here is how some of these other candidates start to, to craft their message on this, because you saw most of the candidates, basically all of the candidates, um, easily dismiss the New York charges um, as, as political rhetoric. They thought they were, they were well beyond what should be uh, brought by a prosecutor. But as details come out of this case, if this case is anywhere near as, lock, as rock solid as prosecutors seem to think it is, and talking to our analysts about it, then this is going to be very hard uh, to, to defend on its merits. Uh, and I think politically speaking, it's going to potentially give some voters some pause about this. Uh, it's going to be up to Republican voters who they want to nominate. But the question that's going to be raised by Chris Christie and uh, as well as Mike Pence and, and other candidates is, is this the kind of um, candidate you want? If he, if he stands accused of these things and what that means for his governance, what it means for his electability, all of that becomes real and relevant. Rick Klein, our thanks to you as always. So much more to get to tonight. The former president of the United States and frontrunner for the Republican nomination in the 2024 election, becoming the first former commander in chief to be federally indicted. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. To crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. 
Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from Jerusalem, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We are joined now by ABC News political contributor and former Trump Justice Department official Sarah Isker. Sarah, thank you so much for talking with us tonight. As you know, this is the second indictment. This comes during a campaign for yet another term in the White House. He has made uh, fighting the charges really the centerpiece of his campaign. How could this help or, or hurt his chances at the nomination? Well, what we're really all waiting to see is how other 2024 Republican presidential candidates respond to this. We've already seen uh, Vivek Ramaswamy say that he would pardon the president. Of course, Chris Christie, Asa Hutchison saying that this really should be a deal breaker. Chris Christie saying these are serious charges. Uh, on the other hand, what we're really looking for is what does a candidate like Ron DeSantis do? You're already hearing from Republican, uh, you know, grass tips, if you will, say that other Republicans should drop their campaigns and support Donald Trump, that this shows um, a lack of even handedness in, uh, you know, our systems of justice. So we'll really find out where the Republican nomination fight is, I think, in the next few days and how they respond. But there's no question that I think in the short term, this is a big help to Donald Trump. He's already fundraising off of it. And for right now, it means all of the attention is once again focused on him. If Ron DeSantis, for instance, wants to make inroads with Republican primary voters, he needed to take Trump voters away from Trump to move them in a different direction. But now for the next several days, weeks, maybe months, it's all going to be about Donald Trump once again. If you get out your crystal ball for us, I mean, what do you think about the, the Republican base here? Do people continue to support Trump? I think that what we've seen so far is that this information was already largely baked in for the Republican electorate. They knew about the classified documents. They knew about the special counsel investigation. And the line that you're going to hear most, I think, from the Trump campaign and from his allies is that there's a certain amount of hypocrisy here, that uh, all sorts of Democrats had retained classified information and weren't charged. Now, of course, the facts are quite different, but it will have a sense of a different type of justice and that Donald Trump has been a target of Democratic prosecutors, whether it's New York or the Department of Justice, and that's going to rally his base around him. Uh, the former president has less Republican allies than he once did, clearly, but, but still does have the support in the party. At what point do those remaining allies start to distance themselves? We certainly haven't seen it yet. Again, I'm very curious how the other Republican candidates will respond to this. Um, you know, Mike Pence started his campaign by attacking Donald Trump for his actions on January 6th. How is he going to respond to this, given that he himself was investigated for retaining classified information and not charged? Um, how will Ron DeSantis, currently the front runner of the rest of the Republican field, respond to this? Nikki Haley, Tim Scott. I think there's a lot of hesitation to attack Donald Trump, something that we saw in 2016. Of course, I was running Carly Fiorina's campaign then, and instead of attacking Trump, most of the candidates spent their time attacking the other non-Trump candidates. It was not an effective way to run the campaign, obviously. Donald Trump sailed into the nomination and eventually won the presidency. Sarah Isker, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Now I want to bring in our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Uh, Terry, just give us a sense of the historical significance of a former president facing a federal indictment like this. You know, you can't think of anything that parallels it. Uh, there were former presidents who disgraced themselves. John Tyler joined the Confederacy. He had been president of the United States. He, he joined the rebellion and, in fact, served uh, in the Confederate Congress. Uh, Andrew Johnson you know, left office in disgrace after he was a drunk and, uh, and did not handle Reconstruction very well, but he was later returned to office in Tennessee. So you can't think of another president with the sole exception of Richard Nixon, who was pardoned by his successor, Gerald Ford, for uh, any crimes that he would have committed during the Watergate scandal. And Ford did it to, he said, spare the country the trauma of the trial of a former president. Uh, that's not going to happen this time.
Joe Biden has stayed out of this. He's going to continue to stay out of it. And so we are likely to see, unless uh, Trump pleads guilty and cuts some kind of deal where there's no indication of that either, we are going to see a former president of the United States on trial by the government that he once ran. And there is no precedent for that. But there's one thing that really abides in American politics, and that's change. It's not 2016 anymore. It's not 2020 anymore. The American people have a remarkable ability to self-correct, to absorb new circumstances, and decides what, what is best for them and their families in the moment and for tomorrow. We're a tomorrow country. There'll be millions and millions of people who will, you know, go to the nth degree to defend Donald Trump, but there'll be millions more who say, what else is out there? That's just in the American character. So we have this extraordinary and unprecedented trial, uh, and it will all depend, really, how it goes politically on how it goes legally, not just a conviction or an acquittal or, or whatever happens, but how the justice system operates. Polls show that Americans are losing trust in the courts, this is a moment for the courts to demonstrate they can do something even this e extraordinary and unprecedented in a way that people can trust. I put this in perspective as far as the, the different weight of, of a special counsel making a federal prosecution like this versus what we've seen in the New York indictment with the uh, allegations of the hush money paid to the porn star Stormy Daniels. Well, Jack Smith isn't elected. He was appointed because he is a veteran prosecutor in national security affairs. Alvin Bragg ran for office in part by signaling to uh, New York voters that he would go after Donald Trump. Uh, that indictment, really, and that legal process bears the burden of that taint, that political taint that he ran for office, essentially promising a, a criminal prosecution. Jack Smith, I don't know if anybody's noticed, he hasn't said a word. He hasn't said a thing publicly. He's just gone about his business, and now his work product is coming before us, the indictment of the former president. And he is known as a prosecutor who gets his ducks in a row, who amasses his evidence. You do not want to be at the receiving end of a Jack Smith indictment, of a federal indictment in general. Uh, and so this is going to be really a, a, a test for the federal process, but for the courts at, at large. And Jack Smith has started it off in as clean a way as he could. A secret uh, process and now the indictment. And Jack Smith doesn't have to say a word. Certainly the indictment speaks for itself. Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make